All right, here we go. We have actor and comedian Joe Torrey. Welcome to Vlad TV. Hey, man. Glad to be here, man. Hey, man. Long time fan. Thank Long you. Long time Thank fan. You watch your movies, watch your stand up, everything, man. Congrats on being, being in the business for this long. Yeah, it's three decades, three man. Three decades. Plus, yeah. Absolutely. It's your first time here. I want to start in the very beginning. So, you were born in Newport News? Yeah. Newport News, Virginia, yeah. Military brat. Yep. And you kind of moved around a little bit, right? You were in Seaside, Jamaica, yeah. Queens. Yeah. And uh, so your dad your dad was in the military, right? Yeah. Army? He's in the Army. Okay. And your mom was a school teacher? School teacher. How many kids total? Six. Six. Yeah, they had six. Three. I have three sisters and two brothers. Okay. Your parents are busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I always say this. My mother, she never drank, never drove, but... She likes sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, six kids. <laughs> she must. She must. You know, born in nineteen thirty-seven. So you got to keep the house warm <laughs> somehow. Got to be motivated. <laughs> and where are you, like, in terms of the order? I'm right smack dead in the middle. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a second boy, the fourth child. So I have two older sisters, an older brother, who also was in the military. He did, yeah, he, like five tours. He was a lieutenant colonel. Wow. Did, you know, Desert Storm. He followed in the family footsteps. I okay. didn't, yeah. You didn't want to do that, though. No, nah, man. You know what I'm saying? I was like, who want a job you can't quit? Yeah. And if you quit, they come looking for you. You know, you ain't doing that. <laughs> so as a kid, were you getting in trouble or were you pretty much a good kid? I mean, you know, as, you know, wherever we were, I got away with what I could get away with. I mean, but humor was always my, you know, my niche or getting out or getting me into trouble. So when my father was away at Vietnam, at war, doing stuff like that, you know, I kind of got more trouble than I was supposed to, you know, because, I mean, you know, he ain't there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that's, I think that's what kind of shaped me. Okay. Moving around and, you know, getting my, my, you know, getting my comic genes, you know, uh, chops and doing, seeing different people in different areas. Right, you're always a class clown. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I made myself a class clown. You made yourself a class clown. <laughs> okay. And then in 83, you went to Lincoln University in mm -hmm. Missouri. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you majored in mass communications and broadcast journalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were also in a fraternity. In a fraternity. Which you still hold hold high to this day. Hold high to this day. Man. And the fraternity is? Oh, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. To the day I die. How important was that during the college days? I mean, that was real important uh, as far as, because I didn't want to go to college. You know, I wanted to get back out to L.A., make it big. And I was, you know, I was you know, a wrestler. So I went to college on a football wrestling scholarship. Mm. And, uh, you know, real good, you know, did it. But uh, you, anything you can use to get you, you know, to Hollywood, get you where you want to be, um, that's what I kind of did. But I always saw this fraternity um, doing these parades. These black men always hopping and doing different things. Or when I went to state championships, my my sister, who was a big uh, she's a big school teacher, big track star. She's she's a legend. Used to run against Jackie Jordan, Kersey, Flojo. She's been so she used to sneak me into the University of Missouri, yeah. and I would see men of Omega just do their thing. But I was like, these are educated guys, but they're a little wild. But they bring education back, and they was always in the community, helping out. Now, wasn't there a situation in college where you got arrested? I arrested a bunch of times in college. Really? Yeah. For what? Wasn't, wasn't because of the frat, just because I was young and drinking and coming from St. Louis and, you know, didn't have a curfew. <laughs> so mm. I got caught in a lot of, you know, disturbing the peace or disorderly conduct, you know, just little fights or little stuff that you learn when you're not away from home. Mm. You can't do this. So, yeah. Did the police show up at one of your classes looking for you? A lot of times. Yeah. Lots of times. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> did you actually do any jail time or was it just a little slap on the wrist type stuff? No, I did some jail time. I did jail time. Uh, you know, they used to let me go to jail sometimes on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> They'd work with you. Yeah, it worked. I, I knew the lieutenant governor. I was a football team. I was like, I got to go to work. I got to go to school during the week. So weekends, check in on you know, Friday at six o'clock or 12 o'clock and get out on Sunday at 12 o'clock, six o'clock. So you had to repeat that. So if I owed 20 days or 15 days wow. or whatever, stuff like that. But that was my first time that, you know, I, I didn't let my parents know about that, but yeah. Okay. Well, they know now. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little slap on the wrist, little. No, it was slap on the wrist. I mean, that's you in the tank with, you know, nine grown men you don't know. You disturbing the peace, you a little drunk, maybe got in a little tussle, and now you're in there with somebody who did murder or, you know, rape somebody or killed somebody. They're facing 20, 30 years, and you waking up, you know, with, you know, your clothes don't fit you. 
Mm. They don't, you know, you're taking your underwear, they're taking your socks, they're taking everything, just throwing your stuff. So you're waking up seeing people with toothpaste in their hair or, you know, chewing gum, you know, messed with them or they, they're shaving or they, or they don't even go to sleep. Mm. Yeah, so it was, it, was a, it was a real, you know, awakening to like, this ain't where you want to be, bro. Oh, yeah. No, I remember the first time I, I got arrested and went to jail. Just a little, you know, a little, little weekend overnight. type stuff, you know, like they're having seizures in my cell and, you know, you're going cell to cell and talking to people who are facing, you know, 20, 30 years. And yeah. you're like, man, hip hop's been lying to me all these years. There's nothing cool man. about about jail. One bathroom with 10 guys yeah. in the tank yeah. and, you, you, and no door. Right. You're right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you graduate college. Yes. This was 87? Yeah, 87. In 87. I really was, you know, 88 I walked, but in the end of 87, I, I was in a terrible car accident um, during the summer of 87. Hmm. So, yeah, you know, so, uh, and it's real because it's, uh, you know, it kind of changed my life a little bit more. So I had to come back and walk, but yeah, 56 stitches and 56 you know, stitches. 56 stitches. But a friend of mine, um, one of them, one of one of them right now who had the worst injury, he just made federal judge hmm. um, out of East St. Louis. But he was in that car accident with me that uh, he had the worst of it. But now, you know, yeah, that was some things, you know, some. Terrible incidents that happened coming from the University of Missouri, drinking and driving, and you know, and uh, and the sober driver, he's the one that fell asleep. Oh, he fell asleep behind the wheel. He almost killed all of us, yeah. So. Wow. Okay. Well, you graduate eighty seven, eighty eight, but you started doing stand up in eighty nine. Mm -hmm. So, what led to you actually going to an open mic? Well, I'm, the first person I ever saw in my life that I wanted to be was Sammy Davis Jr. Mm, okay. Yeah. You know, he was, you know, when I saw on TV back when they just had three channels, he was the only black person I knew that did everything. And he was on every person's show that was white or had a TV show. And he would, you know, he'd kick it with the best of them. He knew comedy, he was doing directly, he was acting, he was, yeah, I see him like, wow, I want to be that, that, that little bad black man is, is amazing. And I want to get inside that television. But I was like, well, do I know I have that much talent as Sammy. So I just focused on what worked for me, which was comedy. So... Using what I had, you know, for the years, I just took that on stage and been a military brat. That's very funny. Hmm. Uh, okay, so your first stand-up. I mean, the first time you took the, you know, you know, took the stage in an open mic. Did you do well or did you bomb? First time I took the stage, I bombed. Okay. But it wasn't really a bomb. You just weren't that funny. It was, yeah, it was a sit-down comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, I was funny. In college, because my gift is just mm -hmm. off the top of my head, naturally just talking stuff. When I just come off the top of my head and I talk about stuff that I did in college, but when I had to put it into an actual act when I got out of college and, you know, like it's beginning, middle, end, people got to laugh, you have to affect more than just the people in front of you. Mm -hmm. And it was about a cat that I had and I put in a microwave. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> I sat down and told the story and it was like, okay. <laughs> people were shocked. Like, <gasps> What was that? <laughs> so the next comedian, I'll never forget him. He was good too. His name was Percy. I think Percy Taylor. He was he was popping back then, and um, and I saw him. He got up and he did a whole bit on how I was not funny. <laughs> 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 How I don't know. At first, it's called stand-up comedy, not sit-down comedy. Because I sat down and told it like I was giving a monologue or something, and uh, you know, say like, wow, and because I, I, I did totally opposite of what I was trying to do, mm -hmm. and um, and I never forgot that. So I used that as motivation to, uh, you know, just get back and get my chops right. And that guy has opened for me like lots of times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so at what point did you decide to move to LA? I always wanted to move to LA, but that was uh, in '89. I had to go back and save my money up. Okay, so, so it was the same year you started doing stand up. Um, well, I started in college, but I, you know, I oh, okay. say you I don't, see what you're saying. Yeah. You don't really start stand up until you start making money. Mm -hmm. and so I moved to LA in '89. Got there in March of '89. Uh, met the late great Robert Harris. Became good friends with him. He took me around a couple places. You had the Birdland, you know, um, in West that was in. Um, Long Beach, T.K. Kirkland, he was running that. Um, and subbing for him was D.L. D.L. was kind of subbing in for him. So, but T.K. and who had the biggest names, the first person I saw was T.K. Right. And I was like, wow, this is L.A. comedy? <laughs> he was out of control. Yeah, he's serious. Serious. He's a regular on my show. Yeah, good friends with T.K. Yeah. But then I seen Robin Harris. And I was like, oh, wow. 
Now, this is comedy. And I felt like Fred Flintstone because I came with my little, you know, St. Louis attitude. And I was trying to heckle Robin Harris and he made me feel like Fred Flintstone when he got that small. He took the whole audience and turned it on me and talked about me. And that was another thing that I used when I got to L.A. It's like, I got to be that guy. Do you remember how he clowned you? Oh, yeah. What was he saying? Because he, he was talking about some, something. And I said, oh, shut up. You don't know. And he just snapped his fingers. Everybody got quiet. Everybody said, ooh, you don't know. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what? And my friend who I was sitting with who invited me there, who was from St. Louis, I looked up to him because I dated his, well, I didn't date him. I went to school with his sister. We were a little boyfriend, girlfriend back in grade school, but he was a big time guy out here. And he was like, man, dude, don't say nothing to him. You're going to get us all killed. And Robin <laughs> just focused on me and that spotlight got right on me. And man, I started shrinking. Before you knew it, my feet were swinging and I just wanted to run out the club. And uh, you know, I never got that, but we became best friends. Well, I've actually heard the story from other people as well. Like, for example, um, Faze on Love. I said this one time, he was at a comedy show with, with Robin Harris. He was wearing some red boots. Ooh. And Robin went in on him so bad that he went in the back and threw those red boots <laughs> in the garbage. Threw them away. Threw them away. And I had some red shoes on, some red boots. Um, and he talked about my boots so damn bad when I got on stage. <laughs> All right, I went downstairs and took the boots off and threw them in the trash. <laughs> I was like, man, don't ever let me buy no goddamn red boots. Uh, yeah, that was my first, uh, and then going up to the comedy act in um, LA. Who else? John Sally said he made the mistake of walking into a Robin Harris show with a pink suit. <laughs> He said, look at this big pepto bismo looking motherfucker. pepto bismo <laughs> He said, went home and threw the suit away. Robin Harris would make you throw your clothes away. Clothes away. Or you, or you, you, you could, back in the day, if they had social media, he made Tommy Hearns mad. Oh, like one boxer. Time. Oh, my God. Tommy Hearns used to come, and he used to talk about how sugar whooped on him. You know what I'm saying? Oh, right he, there Magic, Magic used to come in there. He used to talk about how Magic couldn't talk back in the day. <laughs> I'm serious. He had a list. <laughs> he was like, man, man you, you better not be come, come up here talking like that. <laughs> he was like, I'm glad your passage was smoother than your voice. I used to say <laughs> stuff like that. What, didn't Tiny Lister want to fight him? Like Cockeyed Tiny all the time. All the time. Cockeyed is, is, and Robin would be like, all I got to do is go here. You don't know who you're grabbing. <laughs> <laughs> he used to, uh, Tiny, Tiny took it too far. What would Tiny do in there? He would almost try to either get up there and fight, kick over tables, and do his own, from, you know, because he was from Compton. He was a Debo and, thing? Debo. No, he wasn't Debo. He, he wasn't was Debo, just, yeah, but he, he was, was just, still had the Debo he, attitude, is what, what I'm saying. What was the, um, his, his wrestler name? Zeus. Zeus. He was Zeus. Yeah. Ah, I'm from Compton. You don't talk about me, Compton. Everybody's like, who are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> the stage is that way. <laughs> so he tried to. By the time you make it to the stage, Robert would run through the audience sometimes, like, hey, man, because he would try to choke him out or something. But mm. yeah, it was, yeah, those are good times. God rest, Tiny Yeah, Mr. one of the best. It, well, DL used to come to the show, but I guess DL and Robin didn't really get along? Nah, no, nah, no. Nah. DL didn't come when Robin was alive. Okay. Yeah, because they didn't get along. Yeah, Robin, was Robin, Robin was known for knocking your ass completely the fuck out. He didn't care. Pistols, but he whooped everybody ass. It's about you talking about. He, he, he puts, he put him down. He, I could name names. He didn't care. Um, and if you stole his jokes or you got into it with him or something like that, he was, you know, Robin was about that life. Yeah, I think I remember, um, you know, a kid from Ken plays on my show a few times. You say how Robin used to roll around with a pistol, yeah, like under a uh, under a seat, under a seat, and you know. Um, Actually, here's a story. When I first got here, yeah, Robin, that pistol was, worked very well. They used to, because you could only do comedy a couple places. You had his night on the weekend, maybe at Tuesdays, but then certain nights, I think it was Wednesdays, it was like the Red Onion on Wilshire or something like that. So, you know, back in those days, you know, you can either go to Red Onion there or Red Onion to do comedy because you had to make your stuff. So I didn't know. I'm from St. Louis. I'm out here cracking on all these gangbangers and tell them how to whoop them up and beat them in. And Robin was like, man, you, dad, you ain't in St. Louis. So he literally had to walk me to my car and fire off a couple of shots so they quit following me. Wait, he like, actually had to shoot the gun. Like, hey, he's with me. I told you he's with me. Plop, plop, plop. And he was like, all right. <laughs> was like, Damn. Was like, 
<laughs> I was like, thank you. I said, they really was trying to follow me. And he said, man, they're about to get you, dude. Wow. And I was like, yeah, so. I knew, you know, I had, a, I had a 22, but I only had like three bullets. So. <laughs> there was four of them. Dang. <laughs> there was six of them, actually. Six of them. <laughs> And I, you can I get half of them if you're lucky. I, I didn't have it on me at the time. I was like, really? It's like, that serious in LA? But mm -hmm. I used to talk about people so mad, I mean, so bad, where, you know, they would, you know, they would get offended. And I'm like, you start heckling me. So what do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Mike Tyson would uh, would show up there too, right? Oh, Mike Tyson. Yeah, Mike. My, yeah, he would talk about Mike. But this was before Mike Tyson was champion. Oh, so this one he was still. Well, he became yeah. champion pretty quickly, though, didn't he? No, no, not before Robin passed. The Mike came oh. in. I'm before Robin passed. He used to come in there in Holyfield, and they used to look at each other. You know, I used to see that at the events. They used to look at Mike and Robin would and Tyson. Y'all need to be fighting. You need to be doing this. You need to be. So it was. But I kind of. Yeah, I met Mike Tyson um, in the Comedy Act Theater, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, for real, and just cool. I think I bought, bought him a Heineken or something. Yeah, I interviewed Mike Tyson uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, we had a little moment. Oh, <laughs> we had a, we, I had a Mike Tyson moment where uh, I was talking about the, the various, because you know, he, he likes street guys around him right, and stuff right, like right. that. And I'm like, so so what, I remember I asked him, I was like, so you're a multi, multi, multi-millionaire. You know, what, what attracts you to these street guys? And Mike was like, what do you mean attractive? <laughs> <laughs> you mean attractive, huh? What do you mean attractive? What do you mean? And I'm just like, shit. <laughs> And we're doing the interview in an actual boxing ring. And I'm right. like, he's right there across from me. I'm like, my security ain't going to make it in time if he lunges no. at me. Like, this this is really getting kind of real right now. Zip was kind of the go-between between, like, Puffy and all the Southside Crips. Maybe. Um, you know, what is it, you know, here you are, this multimillionaire, and, you know, it seems like you've always been attracted to the the guys that are still in the streets to a certain degree. Do you think that's a, a fair statement? You know, I'm attracted to them? Well, not attracted to them, but I mean, you like having them around. You're friends with them and you maintain them. You think I like this. having them around? I'm just asking. You think, I like, you think I'm friends? What do you think? You think I like having them around? Well, you just spoke nicely about Zip, so I just thought. Yeah. Um, you know who, I don't know who these guys are? When you talk, what do you say about me? I'm this big, whatever I am, right? But know who those guys are? Those are the guys that when, I'm whoever I am is a nobody. I mean, those are the guys that live in the same building with me. They give my mother salt or sugar if they need the milk. They're the same guys. Wait, wait, how long ago was this? Because which Mike are you talking to? Now Mike? Uh, mushroom Mike? Yeah, or? like, yeah, mushroom weed Mike. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I managed to kind of like talk my way out of it. We became cool again and, you know, yeah. we finished off the interview. But I'm just saying, Mike, Mike could, Mike is still Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I used, to, I used to be Team Tyson. I used to Vegas and see the fights and be on a t-shirt and meet the whole crew. We went through that whole 90s thing. Went and visited him when he was locked up. He made me wait a couple times. I'm like, come on, what are you doing in there? I drove three hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, your first show, uh, it was a Buddy Lewis show and Jamie Foxx was opening yeah. for Buddy. Yeah. And this was Jamie was like first, first, first starting. Ja Jamie Foxx, uh, and, and Buddy Lewis, good friend of mine. When Robin Harris passed, I kind of took over the Comedy Act Theater. So I was taking comedy back into HBCU schools. My Lincoln, I went to Lincoln University, historically black college. So uh, yeah, they was like, bring comedy. Can you bring something back here? You big in LA, bring it back. So we were the first um, homecoming show. That's now a lot of homecoming shows are, you know, that black colleges have now. But it was Jamie Foxx and Buddy Lewis and Jamie open for Buddy. I paid him like three hundred dollars, <laughs> for real. Which was he was that was his first road gig. And we went through St. Louis because that's all I had. The budget was like three thousand dollars for everything. Everybody get yeah. paid, rooming, board, fly in, put this up. But um, that experience, you know, um, meant a lot to you know both of them actually. So, I mean, did you did you see how talented Jamie was back then? I mean, a lot of people say he's like the most talented. Just you know. Comedy, singing, acting, he's got an Oscar, you know, he's got platinum records. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he could do impressions, he, he, he could play the piano. It's like the overall talent level is just immense. Did you see that back then? Uh, yeah, we because we hung out like that. Jamie was he's talented, but not only just talented, just like some of these young cats out here now, he's talented and he wanted to learn. But he was trying to hone all that talent into, okay, what makes what gets me on stage? Because back then, Tommy Davidson had the impersonations, the singing, the dancing, all that stuff wrapped up. Uh, but, but Jamie's an athlete, too. 
Right. So Jamie, yeah, James, he, he, he just about to do anything. So you put him on the board and Jamie focuses on, he does it. But then, you know, we were like, he was, I would say he was my student, but we all hung out like students, um, sharpening each other iron every day, trying to get on stage. And uh, yeah, I even got him his first agent. Nice. All that. Yeah. Nice. Well, 1990, Robin Harris died of yeah. a heart attack. He was 36 years old. Yeah. I mean, he had just done House Party and... Uh, I guess he was going to do Bay Base Kids, but he didn't. He didn't actually live. What did he die from exactly? Was heart attack. It was a heart attack. Yeah, he had a. He, his probably his, his family had like heart issues. Anyway. Oh, okay. so you know. But um, the way Robin was pushing it, I mean, he was handling everything as the next black comedian through the door. He had TV deals on the line. He had movie deals on the line. He had the animation project. Mm. He had he had like five or six deals. But at the same time, he was trying to change his life. You know, he was, you know, still married, still had his, you know, his two kids, but working around the clock, he would yeah. literally go from, I used to cover for him. He'd sell out Mavericks flat around the corner from the Comedy Act Theater in, you know, in South Central. And then he'd sell out that one and he'd be back and forth. And then he'd be coming from the set of Harlem Nights and going back and do another show on the road. And then it was like, wow. And it was, that was, he was the first person I saw as far as knowing how to be a star, but having a family and trying to handle it. And I think the stress was too much. Yeah, man, quite a quite a shock when you heard the news. Yeah. How did it affect you? I mean, it hurt me, stopped me. I mean, in my tracks. It was the same weekend. I never forget that weekend, March twelfth, um, nineteen ninety, nineteen ninety ninety one. Because um, I was supposed to open for him in Chicago. He was doing a special, but I was opening for the Comedy Act, which had, had his opening in Atlanta, mm. and that you know that that opened the doors for so many people. It's it's, it's so it's so. Yeah, I, I know that 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 changing. It was like he died that one night that the Comedy Act Theater opened in Atlanta, but today that Comedy Act opened in Atlanta opened so many careers. Yeah, Cat Williams, Chris uh. Tucker. Um, I mean, everybody from the West Coast. You got to. You, I mean, you can keep naming everybody out of the South to this mm -hmm. day, and uh, he never got a chance to set foot in it. Yeah, sad. It was a loss, man. I was a big fan. Yeah. I think well, he, he, everyone was a big fan. Yeah. He left a lot here. Yeah. Yeah, he left a lot. At least he left something here where you, you were talking about him now. Exactly. And you took over as the MC for the Comedy Act Theater. Yep. Took over as the MC. Um, yeah, it went from 300 plus a night sold out to zero. It's like 15 mm. people coming. So uh, my, my people who helped me was Buddy Lewis, the late, great Yvette Wilson, and Jamie Foxx. And we kind of rebuilt it all the way back. That's how we got so good because we had so much time to like, okay, do in between comedians instead of being two and three minutes on. We had so much time to hone our act. So by that time, the uh -huh. DL started coming around. It got a, its energy back. And um, that's, that's how we got on. We was able to create um, situations where the big time agencies would come down and see us. Well, uh, it was there that you met John Singleton. And you guys are like the same age at the time, right? No, no, no. I'm was he, 57. John's younger than me. He's so. a little bit younger than you. Okay, yeah, so he was younger. even younger than you. Yeah. And uh, was Boys in the Hood already out by then? It wasn't out, um, but I met John. I'm almost the same area I met Mike Tyson in at the Comedy Act Theater, the back of the Comedy Act Theater, back by the bar where, you know, and he was corny, had his little glasses on, talking about he's going to put me in a movie. I was funny. Um, Cause he saw me in an improv group. We used to do this improv group where we just were, you know, we can get up and be ourselves. And he's like, "You're funny. I'm put you in the middle." I was like, "Who the fuck are you?" And he was like, "I'm John." And, and I didn't really see him again until I came from the Strictly Business audition. Martin, Tommy Davidson, and then Robbie Reed invited me over to a picnic, and he was in the kitchen. And he was like, "Yeah, I just wrote this movie. It's doing good right now. It's Boys in the Hood." And I told him I put you in the movie. And I was like, "You're the guy." And we talked for like an hour, and he told me about Chicago and. The rest is history. Well, yeah, I mean, Singleton, uh, he had two Academy Award nominations yeah. at the age of 24, which meant that he was the youngest African-American to ever be nominated for Best Director. That's right, and, and, and screenwriter. So he was, yeah. he started as a writer. That's uh -huh. what his awards were, Jack Nicholson Awards, going from writing. But it, writing takes so much of the time, and he wanted to direct, and then eventually get into production where he can bounce around with Snowfall, and you see where he can, you know. Yeah really wouldn't take so much of his time. Well, and you also met um, Russell Simmons. Yeah. Now, Russell, Russell's different. I met Russell. I didn't know Russell was Russell Simmons. 
This is when Russell used to, you know, Russell used to dress like he didn't have no money. <laughs> you know, well, for real. That's what he get hanging around with rich, rich Jewish people. You, you just look like you're normal. <laughs> and he used to walk up to me drunk at the comedy act, like, you're funny. And I used to get, he wrote his number down on a piece of paper one time. And I was like, what is this? Because everybody, when I started getting a little steam, wanted to be my manager. And I was like, who was that guy, man? I threw the number away. And then um, Ronnie Tanksley, who was uh, Robin Harris's valet at the time, that was with him when he passed. Um, he was dating Robbie Reed, the cast director, and he was he was a friend of mine. He's like, man, what did that guy say to you? I said, me trying to be my manager. He said, okay, did you get his number? I said, yeah, it's over in the trash can. He said, that's Russell Simmons. <laughs> I said, who is Russell Simmons? And he started naming off the whole. I was like looking through the trash can for the number, and I was like, wow. But um, and he was with Stan Lathan at the time. So not uh -huh. his dad. So, but those cats just look regular, like they were just hanging out, and I didn't know they had their post on top of the game. Well, uh, uh, 1990, you had a, a small role in House Party. Mm, yeah, a very small role. <laughs> it you were small a student role? in cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> I was extra on the set. Exactly. That Robin Harris brought me on. Right, because he was uh, he played the dad. Right. He played kid's dad. So in that, so he brought you in to play the extra. No, we're actually he was just come on. He was putting me in situations where I, hey man, you need to come on the set and see what stuff is you want to be in this. And I knew kid play, so I just strategically placed myself. I said, oh, the camera's there. Oh, he, I'm, so I strategically placed myself right there Ooh. and didn't know it was going to make film or get to cut. But, but I, nobody knew who I was back then. I just knew that the camera is this, that, and the other. And, I need to be in the background. And I used to look at the dailies or look at the, you know, when I went in the scene and see what all they captured. And I was like, okay, maybe I just, you know, background artist. Did you watch the reboot, House Party? Um, no. I watched it. Yeah, no. Mm. Yeah, it would. Nah. I really wanted to like it. I really wanted to like it. Yeah. I think the commercials hurt me because it was, you know, didn't make me want to see it because it went away from what House Party was. Yeah, uh, LeBron needs to just, Leave acting alone, man. When you can't play yourself in a movie, <laughs> you're given two big chances to do that between Space Jam and this, and you still can't play yourself. Incredible basketball player. Acting is just not not really for him. Well, how did Michael Jordan do when he played Space Jam? Well, I mean, I think Jordan did better in Space Jam than LeBron did. Yeah, he would say that. Yeah, he could. Yeah. Absolutely. You did. That's that's he's a friend of mine, but I'm like, you know, the same, same, I mean, same movie. Same movie, but one is a classic and the other one is kind of a footnote. You're right about that. And this question I'm going to ask you where you're here, since we're talking about goats. Yeah. Because people always, who's the goat? And I'm like, well, how can you be a goat when you're chasing a goat? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to say between those two. Well, I mean, the, the fact that Jordan kind of stayed on the same team and won all those championships, he wasn't jumping around to, right. you know, whoever the super team was at the time. But, you know, look, LeBron is... Is no joke. No joke. Is no joke, and his career still ain't over. But why can't you have a lot of goats? I mean, you do have a lot of goats, but ultimately, yeah. people like to choose one. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, yeah. It's just the you nature of you human don't really beings. Want, you don't really want that one, <laughs> right? You, know, you don't really want the real goat, right? <laughs> okay, so then, 1991, you were in uh, Talking Dirty After Dark, and was this uh, Martin Lawrence's first film? First film. I mean, I mean, he was in Do the Right Thing, but he had just a small little. Role was this, a, but this was the first film he actually starred in. Yeah, this was his film, Top of Carew, put him yeah. into it. Um, he was trying to, you know, his first film, and I, you know, this film got me in, into a union. So yeah, talking dirty after dark. Right, you were in it, uh, John Witherspoon. Rest in peace. I did his last interview before he passed. Yes, very sad, man. I was such a huge fan. Uh, he was, was he was one of the greatest man of all. Yeah, man. Uh, we went into the hole. I never realized until I did the interview with him that like. Boomerang, which is one of my favorite Eddie Murphy movies, mm -hmm. like all that mushroom belt and all that, like all of that was ad libs. Like right. none of that was in the script. Right. They just threw him in. He went into wardrobe, found the mushroom stuff, and then just created a whole it's, classic it's, moment around it. John uh, had he was. I mean, I guess at that point in life, he had got to a point where he found all the right roles that were perfect for him. Because I mean, we both read for Uncle Ruckus. And I oh. was, you know, and I was like, I was like, I can't be that well, black. Well, he, he wasn't Uncle Ruckus, he was Granddad. <laughs> no, Granddad, whatever. The, yeah, yeah the granddad. granddad part. He yeah. was, he, I said, man, I can't, I was like, he was, we were in the same voice session. 
And I was, John was giving it, and I was like, whoa, I, you know, really? You want us to go there? And they were like, yeah, and I, I, I couldn't go there. And John was comfortable just talking and being in his world, and you really see him and every, everything you see in him. And I was like, I mean, watching the master and working with masters like that, because that wasn't the only thing I was in with him, sprung mm -hmm. um, in the jail scene. Mm -hmm. um, it was another one. So. Yep. Yeah, I was actually in the Boondocks. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Did you? Yeah, I was yeah, one yeah. of the episodes. Remember, they came to Vlad TV yeah. when uh, Thugnificent yeah. was beefing with the, the Soldier Boy character, Sergeant Gutter. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah man. Great that was a, That was an era. That was an era where you could go there. Yep. Now it's like. Nope. Oh, can't say that. <laughs> and now it's like, yeah, I feel you. Okay, so John Witherspoon, uh, Tommy Lister was in it. Uh, Mark Curry. Yeah. Uh, but this film didn't do very well. I didn't know at the time. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, Rodney, the late, great Rodney Winfield was in there as well. Um, a lot of people was in there. Um, but I, I mean, at that time, um, for a black film coming out, for Top of Carew, I mean, I, did, I didn't know it didn't do well. I mean, for because you, you didn't know after that. You know, you, did, you just, hey, I was in a black film. Mm -hmm. It went to the theaters. So you didn't count box office and numbers and stuff like that. Right. You're also strictly business that, that right year. after that. That one did well. That did very well. Yep. Tommy Davidson, Holly yeah. Berry, yeah. Kim Cole, Samuel L. Jackson was in it. Yeah. Um, this one did well, but it didn't really get widely released. It wasn't like all the theaters. It was just selected theaters. Remember back then, they would kind of, mm -hmm. you know, play touch and go with these movies. Uh, where did that movie, the, the first lead was A.J. Johnson, mm. not Holly Berry. And the director was Andre Harrell. Ah, Andre okay. Harrell. Um, yeah, so that movie, and then, you know, it, so it kind of took a turn where, where uh, you know, I think Kevin Hooks had to come in and just finish it up, and because it was, you know, I guess creative differences between that, and they got rid of the AJ and Holly Berry. I mean, uh, AJ and, and, and Andrew Hurl. Andrew Hurl, yeah, Holly and Berry. And they, they brought yeah. in Holly Berry, and so it was kind of at that time, it was, you know, you didn't really scrap get, it together, yeah. Yeah, you couldn't really, you know, you would have, as a black film, you have a chance to play like that with the director and the actor and then get it out. And at, at the time, you said you were going to get it out on budget. So, um, but, it, you know, it turned out, I guess, great. See, yeah. for, from, on paper, it didn't do anything for, um, you know, probably for the studio, but for careers. Yeah. You know, it did, it did a lot. Weren't you in a film called The Three Muscatels? Yes. And wasn't that Richard Pryor's last film? And his last film. That he was actually in? Yeah. And did you actually hang out with him on, on set and get to yeah. know him a little bit? Yeah, that, that Three Muscatels. Uh, that was Flynn Pryor, his, his next to last one. I think he married Flynn twice, um, his seventh yeah. wife or something like that. But Flynn, he had two kids by her. But yeah, we also did a concert uh, in, in Atlanta. And that's how I met Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor was one of my biggest idols. And I used to, I used to go sit by the edge of the bed with him when I got back um, off tour on Monday nights when he lived off Moraga Drive and just sit with him on Mondays and Tuesdays when he was really going through his, uh, his, you know, his, 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 his disease. And it was like, yo, and it, for real. And he used to give me, he used to real. He used to give me the real. Um, Cause his wife was in Atlanta. So she was Jehovah's Witness and she was living there and they built the house and all that. But uh, yeah, that movie Three Musketeers, which he financed <laughs> and financed and financed, learned a lot, and uh, you know I was in the right place at, at the right time, man. Like, you know, and and learned a lot from some, you know, from the heroes. What do you think was the best advice that Richard Pryor gave you? Because everyone, I mean, when you look at the modern era, you know, I feel like everyone does their best kind of Eddie Murphy impression, and Eddie Murphy was trying to do his best Richard Pryor impression. Exactly. So. This is kind of like the godfather of what I consider modern comedy. Okay. So what did you learn from hanging out with him? Well, at, at this state, I learned he, he gave me, you know, information about my business. Mm. You know what I'm saying? As far as, you know, you know, him and Clarence Williams III. I mean, anybody, get your accountant together. Have your accountant together. Get your business, pay your taxes. They, it was, that's one first thing he told me. Uh, and then, um, then it was like, why are you on stage? And and what's your longevity? What are you looking for? What are you saying to the people out there? You know, because he's not just talking to a specific audience. And he just little things. He just he just say, "What are you talking about?" I say, okay, "What are you saying? How long do you think you can say that?" Because <laughs> I was a single man talking about stuff, and it was like, "Yo!" So he made me really look at the longevity of him. But I also saw um, what a, the major thing I learned from him is um, how you can be most blessed and talented and have the most gifts and trophies in the world, but you can't get next to them. 
Mm -hmm. I used to see the houses and he had in Mexico and the house he had all over the places where he couldn't even enjoy his mansion in Moraga. His Grammys, some of the Grammys were dusty and broken up on the fireplace. And, and I was like, wow, I, I was like, if anybody was my martyr in life to say, okay, I've been through racism, I've been through drugs, I've been through abuse, I've been, I've seen it from, you know, pretty much bad from a kid and I made it. And it, and it took, and it, and he was still alive to see all that, even to see his own demise. Mm. And I was like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I ever want to be in that situation to see me go up, down, around, and then can't do nothing about it. But um, it was amazing to to see how you can create your own world and then destroy yourself in it. Yeah. Well, in 1992, you were I think 27 at the time. That's when you got your big break, which was hosting Def Comedy Jam because Martin Lawrence had left the show. Yeah. Why did Martin Lawrence leave? Martin, it was it was it was time for Martin to leave Def Comedy Jam. Blowing up and too big, yeah. and it was it was too much. It was too much pressure. He we were taping. He was taping like five shows like uh, in the weekend. So every, every time he came up, it was five shows a day. So if we if it was the season, he'd be taping like from you know nine in the morning, like nine to the night, wow. and then going back and doing the movies and doing Martin and coming back. And then it was too much where you, you don't want to burn yourself out. Because, you know, back then, you, you, you either did movies, you either did television, you didn't really put all that together. You either made your money on the little TV or you made it, or you're a movie star. You're a television star or you're a movie star. You do right. commercials or you do this. So it was like, but when cable started getting more, you know, popular and people started having it and the way to go, it was like, okay, how do you, you know, challenge both of those worlds and, and fit into them? And he was at a good place at a good time where he made them fit. But it was, you know, it was challenging. I mean, Martin was a hell of a host. So you had very big shoes yeah. to fill. I mean, was there a little bit of hate in the beginning where it's like, oh, we miss Martin? Because I mean, like I said, like he was so dynamic yeah. in that role and now you have to fill those shoes. Was it hard at the beginning? Um, no, I mean, not being, you know, cocky about it, but it wasn't hard you because slid, I- Slid right in. I thought I should have the job before Martin had. Ah, there we go. So it was, you know, to me, I was like, Martin's not a host. <laughs> Because Robin Harris had died. Robin was supposed to be the first host of Def Comedy. Oh, he was supposed to be yeah. the first Robin Def was Comedy. A host. Oh. Yeah. So when I used to see Russell Simmons and Andre Rail um, down in Atlanta at the Jack the Rapper, you know, uh, that whole little thing, they used to ask me who was the next one, who you think is the next one after Robin died. And I was like, it's me. But at that time, it wasn't social media. It wasn't um, anything you had. You had to go with what the people knew. And Martin had uh, made some appearances on the, uh, the, big, the big national show. Um, what was it? Got the big show that uh, that's like you know, um, be a star now. Whatever it was. Star Search. Stars. He was Star Search. He had some moments on what's happening, mm -hmm. and he had a couple of appearances in the movie. So it was like, yo, who are you? I had nothing out there but maybe Apollo. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then Jamie Foxx. So I was like, hey, there's nobody, there's nobody funnier than me and Jamie right now, and then me. So when Martin took over. It was like he he surprised me because I thought Martin couldn't be a host. I thought he was more of a, just a he's a comic that couldn't stop and break his jokes up. Mm -hmm. But when he did it, I just learned. Okay, we we both learned from Robin Harris, and I was like, man, we helped each other. Robin Martin is a good friend of mine. Like we used to, I helped move when he bought his first got his first check and went and bought his new truck. We went and picked up his girlfriend. I was there with him. We rode down to the hood and seen him. Yeah, I was always, always that, that guy. I helped him move a couple of times. So it was like, we, we, it was love. It was never no hate. Well, by that next year, 1993, John Singleton, who you had met earlier, mm -hmm. he had kind of blown up with Boys in the Hood and he was getting ready to do his second movie, Poetic Justice. So he approached you as the role of Chicago. Yes. Uh, and I guess Ice Cube was supposed <laughs> to be, was supposed to have Tupac's role? Right. No, what? no. Um, yeah, things he, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. But what was Tupac's character's name in that movie? Um, um, Justice. Oh, come on. It was um, Lucky. Lucky. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So Ice Cube was supposed to play Lucky. Right. But Tupac got it. What was, was there, do you know why? Because well, cause they'd already worked together on Boys in the Hood. But um, I think from what I heard, and John was a real G. John didn't take it. Um, I think he was telling me that John, that like, Q wanted to change the characters up a little bit. Huh. Kind of wanted to play my role. 
know what I'm saying? Because it was a love story. And I don't think he was trying to take his career that way. Yeah, you're right. I don't think he's had any love type roles. Exactly. Really ever. So thank you. Yeah. So he was wanted the more, you know, aggressive role, mm -hmm. which was mine. Right. But that it was a love story. So my role wasn't aggressive. I just, you know, had gotten to it with her in one scene, but he wanted to change that whole kind of character to where it fit more where he was going. And John was like, that's not the movie, it's not the script. So, I, and he said that, you know, Cube wouldn't call him back and he wasn't returning phone calls. And he wasn't, you know, it was whatever they had disagreements. So it was like, yo, Tupac was next up in line. And I was like, who's Tupac? And he was like, oh, Juice. And, this. and I was like, and man, boy, did that work because, I mean, come on, Tupac is a great actor, man. Yeah. And uh, that, that, that whole, I think that whole anticipation of what it could have been made everybody, uh, you know, get their chops up. Well, you've said that Tupac is a better actor than Ice Cube. Yeah, he's a better actor than most anybody. Most rapper, any rapper ever lived. I mean, you name yeah, you, no, you name I mean, a better rapper. Now actor. that I think about it, yeah. <laughs> Who on, is man. a better rapper actor than Tupac? And he didn't even get into his chops I mean, yet. Will Smith, you could say, he's pretty good. He's got an Oscar. Just got an Oscar. Just got an yeah. Oscar. He, he Took had him more like chance. Fifty years to get. Had, had more chance. Fifty years. <laughs> fifty years. But I mean, but he's Will Smith. Yes. And everything except for maybe Muhammad Ali. That's um, I am legend. Was kind yeah, yeah, of yeah. I, I'm I love I am legend. Yeah, and and yeah. of course, but he know, wasn't acting with nobody. Yeah, you're right. He's by himself with <laughs> a dog. Dog and some right. monsters. <laughs> it's a bunch of monsters. I mean, well, and and of course, he he did a great job playing uh, Venus and Serena's dad, oh, yeah, which he, right. which he won the he Oscar for. He was great. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, take that back. He was. Very, very, it really impressed me now. Yeah. Although I think that Pac, if given a chance, he could have uh, actually developed his acting into more into more roles where it's not just Tupac. Well, that's where he was not going. Bishop. <laughs> you know, that not... A lot of people didn't know that's where he was going. He's an actor first. Oh, yeah. No, I remember um, Edie uh, from the Outlaws, who, who I'm friends with, told me that before Pac died... I guess he was being offered the role in Independence Day that Will Smith ultimately got. Mm. And he was basically like that last album, you know, like the Machiavelli album, he was just going to give that away as a free mixtape because he was like, man, I'm cool with this music shit. I'm just going to go. I'm about to be a big action star, a huge budget movie. Because, you know, he had done films, but they're all somewhat smaller films, you know, right. Juice, Poetic Justice, like he hadn't done anything on the status of an Independence Day yet. So he figured, okay, I'm going to get this role, I'm going to kill it, and then I'm just going to be a full-time actor and the hip-hop shit, I'm just going to, you know, put behind me. Right, because he, he had a bunch of different roles. I mean, he was in Gridlocked. Gridlocked was... Where he played a drug addict. Played a drug addict. Played, uh, I mean, uh, very different. You didn't see Tupac at all. You saw, yeah. a, you saw an, an addict, you saw a friend. You saw, um, he saw his acting chops, and I think that's where he was trying to go. That's when we last spoke, he was trying to do that. He was going to direct, produce, yeah. and go in that direction. Um, and, uh, hey. Right, I mean, Janet Jackson was yes, yes. essentially the star of the film. Yes. She was the biggest movie star, well, celebrity, period, Yeah. in, in the film. Uh, and, of course, Regina King. Regina King. Who went two, on to just two beautiful kill queens? It. Yeah, two beautiful queens in the film that they've been doing that for a long time. They all three of them had been acting since they were like twelve. Yep. So, and I guess like uh, Pac turned twenty one mm -hmm. while you were filming. Yes. And that's when you got the thug life across the stomach. And these days, yeah. having your body tatted up, having face tats is like regular. But back then, no one was really doing this, no. especially on you know, you know, uh, black celebrities. You know, I mean, you see the white boys, you know, whatever, like the bikers would get all tatted up. But right. having a huge thug life across your stomach, that was considered like, whoa. Well, I, I don't know if it was, was it 50? It was 50, I think it was 50, the 50 yeah. N-word or the thug life. I think it was the 50 N-word at first. He had 50 niggas right there. For, and, right. It, and, it was, and I think we, it was small, but he had that as a machine gun. And it was like right in between the filming. And whatever tattoo it was, it was like, okay, but you have a sex scene with Janet. <laughs> and about a week or two, that wasn't there in another scene. <laughs> it suddenly pops up. <laughs> and it's going to be bleeding, and it's, uh, you know, it's you got to, I mean, it's coming. It's not even healed. It's not going to be healed. Right. And he had a big white bandage. <laughs> you can see the blood coming through it. It's like, 
Dude, what do you what just happened? You got shot? No, nah, I had tattoos. He was just doing young stuff, crazy stuff. Like, I mean, really 20-year-old, 21-year-old stuff, you know, like, and the closer he got to Oakland, the worse he got. Well, uh, there was that story that uh before doing like the the kissing scene with Janet Jackson, mm -hmm. I guess Janet wanted him to take an HIV test. It wasn't Janet. Now, you got, you got Janet. You know Janet, what I'm talking about, though. This yeah. became a talking point. It became a talking point, but so many different stories from it, but you had to be there. So you had to look at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. all right? So, um, yeah, everybody loved pop when the movie first started. But we did everything. We were around each other for like 12 weeks. That's three months. 12 weeks? It yeah. took that long to film it? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we really drove every place, and we rehearsed, and we did everything. We were in each other's faces. Cabins, and we were staying in hotels. It was great. And Janet was professional. Every time. Mm -hmm. She came early, stayed late. She packed her stuff up, went to Bego with her crew or whatever. And you know what I'm saying? And they, oh, we need Janet back. She'd come back, set up, do it. Um, everybody was like that at first. Um, and then with Janet, but then at the same time, I mean, you would see, you know, Pac was a rap star. So you would, we were, the trailers are right there. So you would see the different women that came in and out of the side of Tupac's trailer. He's smoking weed, going everywhere to the set, you know, women, and they banging girls in the set. He was just being Pac. So her crew looking at that were like, yo, anything happened to Janet, Janet come with like 30 people working with her. Mm -hmm. If she, Janet ain't working, you're not getting a check. So at that time, AIDS was pretty popular. She caught a cold when she kissed Q-tip mm -hmm. in one of the first scenes. Two days, she couldn't work. They had to reschedule, shut down. Change scenes. That's a lot of shutting around. Like, but, but they got her better. And it was like, okay, she couldn't be sick and doing on film. But that was just a, in the first scene. So they looked at, the, at her and um, what she was going to be exposed to a little more when you saw T Tupac just, you know, just having this way with women and being <laughs> a young guy. And they were like, okay, you got a love scene, sex scene, all this stuff with her. And then and his attitude got more, you know, aggressive and not showing up. And um, you know, and I think there was a rumor going around about you know, he, you know, he, Tupac burned her or gave her something because women kind of knew he was hitting that one, hitting that one, and that extra. So they probably would say something. And by that time, it was like, yo, he need to get an AIDS test before we put all this, you know, into our investment. We put him next to Janet. So it wasn't Janet. And it was more her people saying, you know, because she wasn't tripping. Janet was not worried at all. Janet was the perfect professional, and it never came from her. Yeah, I mean, John Singleton, I think he was on Drink Champs where he said that both him and Tupac had a crush on her. Who didn't have a crush on Dan? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> what, what I was like the finest woman on earth. Like <laughs> I've had a crush on Janet since she was Penny on she Good Times. Penny on Good Times, right? <laughs> so, what are you talking about? <laughs> I, see, I think she's a year older than me. Mm. No, you're younger than me. So right. my, my crush is legal because I think she was nine or 10. <laughs> right. And you said that, you know, when you guys first started filming, Pac was very professional, but as time went on, he would, I guess, disappear on weed runs. Yeah. Uh, I guess he almost killed you and John Singleton in a Jeep once. Well, yeah, before we got out of LA, this was when he turned 21 and they bought him a Jeep Cherokee on his birthday. And we didn't know that John, I mean, that Tupac couldn't drive. So we just, you know, first couple of weeks, we were, you know, we, instead of taking the, you know, the, uh, Vans back, we were like, are we gonna ride with Pac? Because they brought the car up to the set and we were riding through Griffith Park. And he was, man, we were almost into the park. <laughs> it, was like, it was like, you know how to drive? <laughs> so they got, they stopped the car and they got John, myself, and Regina out. And they was like, nah, you're about to kill the cast, you can kill yourself, but you're not about to kill the cast in the first couple of weeks. And that's when we knew that he couldn't really drive. You don't know that when you know when you jump in a car with somebody, you know, right after the set in this Tupac and you're, you know, your friend, you're trying to be peer and hang out and you didn't know they couldn't drive, especially through Griffith Park if you up, down, and heels and around. And yeah. Well, I mean, I got to watch the movie again. You know, I had to brush up. Oh, yeah. Br uh, brush up. Pardon, brush up. Literally pun, brush up. Right? <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> you and that brush. Yeah, <laughs> that whole thing. I brush, man. I remember that, that one argument that, that you and... You and uh, you know, you and Pac got, you know, in the movie, it was just yeah. like, you know, you were clowning his rapping. He's like, motherfucker, what could you do? He's like, I could dress. <laughs> yeah. A lot of that shit, that shit was ad lib. That, that shit was ad lib. Me. Most of the shit, the shit that John used to let me just say some of my lines, especially when Regina and I were arguing at the at the thing. Mm -hmm. um, some of those lines, you ain't a beautiful motherfucker and all that. Yeah, those were just made up. We were. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, like the, the argument between Pac and Janet, 
in the car before she, you know, yeah, left. Was, yeah. She's like, fuck you, Fuck's bitch. It was, I was like, oh, this is so real right now. That was not there. Because he was getting, Jenna was getting on his nerves. Really? Why? He was getting close to, o- to Oakland. Some of those things. His, ah. He was getting bad. He couldn't get the weed he wanted. So they were, I didn't know they was making weed runs. I'm like, why is he gone? Where are we doing? He's supposed to go to dinner. But he'd be trying to go there and get weed and come back. And then, you know, back then, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know if weed was good or bad. I wasn't smoking it like that. So I can understand if he was getting it, it was showing. And, you know, we were getting frustrated with it. So when you saw some of them things, he was just showing up on set. Like, we had been waiting for you for two, three hours. Wow. So now you're coming up like, you know, now you got an attitude? Mm. So I used to let him have it. I used to talk about him so bad. You guys got into arguments? I mean, an argument. You just talk shit about him. Talk shit about him. He would take it. What are you going to do? <laughs> You're the one slate, motherfucker. Slate, but I'm, back then I was weighing like, what, 195? Oh, yeah, you were kind of cocky. 370. Yeah. Don't I know all my martial arts? Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. You, now you're being disrespectful. Oh, yeah. And that, that argument between you and Regina King, when she was like, that's the reason I'm fucking somebody else. Then, you know, it's just like that long, long pause where I think you finally put that brush in your back pocket for the first time in the movie. You just went, whap. <laughs> now, it's a little, little insight about that. Okay. That scene was supposed to be a lot quicker. Um, and the stuntman, great stuntman, um, he was, Pac and I was fighting like we were in a cowboy scene, like in a saloon. Mm. We were fighting for like 10 minutes. He'd throw me over here, roll, 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 roll. I was like, that's, we're not, we're brothers. We ain't gonna be fighting out here, especially if nobody can bring it up. Mm. Somebody get thrown to the ocean. He's gonna be a this, that, and for real, I kind of coordinated the It was on the, the cliff, sort of, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, so I was like, we're not, we didn't, we're not that angry at each other to be, you know, to give us a moment we had. Um, so, when, you know, when that scene came along, I mean, I, they wanted to take it longer, and I was like, nah, I, I didn't want to, pl- and that's the point about playing that character. I didn't want to come off like rap, just like a regular guy. Some of the strengths about me playing um, dark roles in comedies or drama or something is kind of bringing a little sensitivity in there because I, you know, I didn't want to hit her. But after I thought about it, I wanted people to process that I'm not a woman, you know, beater. But I mean, what man would take that? All the stuff she said, and then take the time to think about what she said, and then and she would just still. <laughs> <laughs> So that was, you know, was just think about what she's saying before you do that. And I, and I think that's the problem with, in a lot of relationships, you don't have that time to think and 15 seconds to think can get you, you know, in a lot of trouble. You know? Yeah, that uh, Janet Jackson kicked you the nuts? About 15, 20 times. <laughs> yeah, that, that wasn't. <laughs> and that's funny because- Take oh, eight. Yo. <laughs> Go hit those nuts again. And then, yeah, and then it was like, they was trying to get that scene. But Oprah came to see Janet during that interview. Okay. We were closer to Santa Barbara, so I think Oprah was staying up that way. Mm-hmm. And she came on, the, and then it was like, okay, we got to get this scene. And Janet went, it was, they got to look right because they get her and they get me and make it look right from her angle. And it was like, okay, but we got to get this in with Oprah. So, you know, can we come back after lunch? I'm like, so she kicked me another 25 times? <laughs> Yeah. So she was really kicking in the nuts? Oprah was like, hey, it really hurts. Didn't look like it hurt. I'm like, yeah, yeah Oprah, that's okay. <laughs> but she, you can have her. <laughs> Let me go get some ice for my balls. <laughs> what the heck's going to that? Well, yeah. Right. And after that whole fight scene, you got left right there on the side of the road. I guess you're like, he said, he's 15 miles from Oakland. So you had to walk 15 miles. 15 miles. Well, and you were never seen from again for the rest of the movie. You know what I'm saying? That was it. Just, just like, I mean, I'm was, waiting for you to come back in the movie and you just never come back. That, 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 that was it. I, couldn't, I couldn't talk myself into another scene. I was no. like, can I show up later? <laughs> oh, outside? John, can I just? <laughs> no. I mean, hey, I, I, I stayed up there, you know, mm-hmm. big, nice hotel. We were at, you know, San Francisco to finish that up, but that was it. And he did, people think he threw my, my you know, how did he get his brush back? He threw it in the ocean. No, he threw this. your hat, right? No, he threw my brush. Because everybody liked when he threw the brush, because okay. they hated that brush. But he threw it up in the road. He couldn't. And I went and checked, because I found it. So I brushed my hair again. <laughs> <laughs> all, those little, all those little scenes are very important, but, um, but people hated that. But that brush was my Linus blanket. If people ask, if you want to know, it's like, why are you brushing your hair so much? Because that was, that was, John said, that's your Linus blanket. You know, when you, when you, when you about to lie or tell something, you need to be comfortable and you're arguing with her, you would go brush your hair. And, but he got that. He said he saw me doing that 
um, hanging out with me before mm. I went out. And he said, I, how I used to kind of, because I wore a little haircut like that. And I used to just kind of just brush my hair. And he's like, you ain't ready yet in the mirror. So he kind of put that twerk into the yeah. film. But it worked. We're yeah, still we're, talking about it all these years yeah, later. I'm, I'm natural doing it. I, yeah. I, got some, I got some Joe Torre Chicago brushes coming out. Well, uh, the movie got released, and I guess some theaters refused to actually show it. Um, for real? I never heard that. Which yeah. ones were that? Certain theaters felt like, you know, they're worried about violence in the theaters and stuff like that. This was during the time mm. that, you know. Right, right. It was right after, well, if it was trying to emulate another, um, you know, John Singleton film where, you know, it caused that. But I don't, I don't, that one was, um. I mean, we had, we, we won our weekend with an amount of, you know, we won our weekend. So yeah. it was like, whatever it did, less of, we won the weekend. It did it. Which was the number one thing to do. You got that phone call. Cling, ling, ling. You guys are number one movie in the nice. weekend. Nice. Good to be in. <laughs> right. And I guess uh, Pac was supposed to be in higher learning, but he got kicked off that role because he had gotten arrested. And I guess the, the nah. you know, the film yeah. company didn't want to risk anything. John was gonna do amazing things with Tupac. He knew, he, it was like that coach you find an actor. You know what I mean? You're Kyrie Irving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. were, or you find that, and it's like, what are you doing? Yeah. Don't mess us up right now. Yeah, like with De Niro, De you know De Niro, what I mean? And, like, uh, come on. And Scorsese, yeah. Man, right, but, right. but but Pac was Pac. Pac was, um, Pac was real. He didn't want to live in that moment, and I did that. And, and I don't think that's when he got in a fight with the Hughes brothers or something like that, right? Yeah. He did get in a fight with yeah. the Hughes brothers. Yeah, and he, was, he was supposed to be the, the Muslim guy and the Hughes uh, brothers. And you know, kind of like how you described the Ice Cube situation. Because I remember uh, Mo Preem, his brother. Yeah, Mo Preem, I know, that's was here. And- uh, Love Mo. Yeah, basically, well, Mo Preem talked about this and uh, MC8 talked about this also, where they basically said like, when Pac showed up, number one, he was late once again. And then like when they were doing the reads, he was like, so what's the backstory of the guy? You know, can't we have him do this? And you know, we should have him do this. And then like, you know, the Hughes brothers like, come on, man. like. This is the script, you know, like you're not going to change it around <laughs> as we're already starting. He was like, ah, fuck that. And he just basically stormed out. I was like, fuck that film. And that was that. But they got in a fight. Yeah. Well, later. <laughs> yeah. The so. fight came later during <laughs> yeah. well, Spice One talked about this yeah. during the filming of the Spice One uh, video for uh, Trigger's Got No Heart. Yeah. So, but he was, his thing. And was, they sued him over that. Yeah, they sued him over that. But he was, at that time, I to me, I mean, he didn't really... I don't think you really respected the Hills Brothers. Mm. Just conversation. And not as far as um, artistic value, but I can't, where he think they respected him where he could take the film. Because he was kind of moved some stuff. So whatever they wanted him to do, that was their thing. But I know when he talked about it, it was like, yeah, I was trying to do this and blah, blah, blah. And I guess, you know, um, I mean, because, you know, what have they done that to Denzel? Or were they listening and say, hey, we can do this to that character. But at that same time, John wasn't letting Ice Cube change the role of that character. So, you know, it's either, you know, this way or the highway. But I mean, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's, a, you know, that's, that's a, I guess if you're trying to take control of your character or, or should I, your career back then, Pac kind of knew some of the characters you wanted to play and how you wanted to portray them. Well, that next year, 94, uh, Tupac is shot uh, at Quad Studios. Mm -hmm. Were you maintaining contact with them through this whole time? I mean, as much as I could. I mean, back then, you didn't have, I think you did with pagers out then. I think so, yeah. <laughs> if, if you had one on the phone. But yeah, when he, yeah. Um, when he got shot, because I used to be in New York a lot. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all that, just, if you if you know, if you know New York, you know how, whoa. You're even more sensitive toward because you know how that went down and where that studio is and I know exactly where it is. what the whole vibe is all about, yeah. you know. And it was like, man, really? So in your mind, I it's mean, it's Midtown you know, Manhattan. It's a relatively yeah. well. It was, it was I mean, now it's super safe. Back yeah. then, it was Back still then it relatively was, safe. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was, but to, but to know that, oh, yo, you because you would only know about that's going on if you knew you were in the business like that. So it was like, and to see that all that activity, and and. and for that to go down like that quick, that much, that happened, it was like, wow. So for him, but too, like, man, you gotta, you gotta understand. Um, when you heard about something happening to Tupac, or Bobby Brown back in the day, you just thought they were invincible. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, and? Yeah. No. They're alive, right? No, right, no, I, know. Know, I know stories about Tupac getting shot at that nobody knows. Not shot, but shot. Shot at, yeah. You know, there was all these incidents of him getting into with people and, you know, oh, drive-bys yeah. and all types of shit. And he pulls out his gun and shoots back. And so he was just into a lot of shit 
All he, the time. Well, you know what it was? He wasn't really into a lot of shit. He was like, oh, your brother. And that's what hurt him because he felt like, oh, I'm, I'm, I got to be there with you. I'm, I'm going back. You into it, I'm to it. And I was like, no, you, this, this, is, this ain't your fight. Yeah. See, he made a lot of fights his that wasn't his. And sometimes I used to be into it and I used to be like, we good. You good? You good? He's like, I'm good, dog. Go on. Just come on, man. Go on. We got this. Sure. I'm like, dude, we sure? Because I know this is going to turn into. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, but but it, it was more of a, I ain't starting nothing. He was more like, you know, I'm your brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it never. Never I seen Tupac restart stuff. It was most stuff he was coming in on that, okay, uh, you got it or I got it. Yeah, I mean, I guess you said after he got shot, because he was so much, you know, for the people you know, yeah. for the black community yeah. that he never thought that they would turn against him and try yeah. to kill him. And I guess after that happened, you said that it crushed his spirit. Well, not even that. I think before, just knowing that um, as a black man growing up and not knowing that everybody don't have your same heart, your same hustle, your same, if everybody don't want the same things you want and you're riding for them. And you find out that, what? You the same people that want me dead? You don't want to see me succeed? Because he was on some king shit, and it was, you know, you know, you riding with, you know, is um, is, I think uh, yeah, Jim Brown told me this one time. He said sometimes you can't make, you know, some people sometimes people are just a good soldier, they're not a general. Yeah, and they can be a hell of a soldier, but when they become a general, it's a whole other mindset. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you try to make the good soldier a general when that's not the gift. Yeah, I think. Uh the Spice One that I spoke to about this, I guess Pac told him that he basically lit, and after he got shot at Quad, he lit like a bloody blunt <laughs> and smoked it. He figured, okay, I'm dying. Let me just, <laughs> let me just smoke my blunt <laughs> as I go out. And, uh, you know, he survived. Did you speak to him after that? I mean, after that, yeah. After he got, yeah, I, I, spoke, to, I spoke to Pac until the last time after he got shot okay. in Vegas. Did he yeah. talk to you about the Quad shooting? Um, Not really. He didn't want to really mention that. I mean, because I wrote and sent him stuff in jail and stuff like yeah. that. But uh, I mean, it was because I, I was, we were at a time where um, um, I used to write jokes and Pac used to write rap. Mm -hmm. And we compared guns. We were into that <laughs> stuff. You know, we're young, stuff like that. So then that was it. Um, and we were trying to still find our voice. I mean, for real. Because at first he was, like, he had a, you know, it was a, it was a, he was, Ice Cube was dominating. So they kind of had a same little, a little kind of cadence. And he was trying to separate himself from that. Mm. Right, because Ice Cube was the bigger rap star yeah. early on by yeah. a lot. Yeah. You know, between NWA, America's yeah. Most Wanted, Pac was still. He found you know, his way. Yeah, he was still, you know, trapped, came out, it didn't really do that well. You know, Brenda's got a baby, made a little bit of buzz. Right. When my homies call, not really, you know, that I get around came out, and it's like, oh, okay, that's his first hit record somewhat, but it wasn't a massive hit yet. No. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't until but, later on that really he really kind of got into a stride, like Dear Mama and everything else like that. I, I think Ice Cube took a a, a huge like opportunity to tell to make these rappers think about what they were saying, and I mm -hmm. think that's kind of where Pac took it because it's like a, I think that was America Most Wanted when he was, and it was just man, he just and that cadence, that tone, because mm -hmm. Cube talked about everything. Just not, you know, I'm rich, I'm famous, I'm this. He talked about politics. He talked about this. He talked, yeah. and I think that window was like at that time it was so huge. You know, you, I mean, it was like me. I wanted to be Rich Breyer. I wanted to be Eddie Murphy. You know, I wish I could sing like Luther. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but when you grow up, you're like, okay, I have more of a this Caden. You know, but nice, nice direction to go in, in and in you know, in a temple to follow. Well, you actually visited Mike Tyson in prison. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you guys were that close? Yeah, Mike was Mike, Mike, Mike was my guy, man. Mike was, yeah. Mike was my guy, for real. I would go to Indiana and drove. Like I said a couple times. I seen him twice. Second time I didn't see him. He had it all shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then, yo, I think another time he was he had a visitor that was much more period than me. <laughs> <laughs> you remember who it was? <laughs> I mean, they were like, wow, how would I know? Oh, okay. It was like a famous. They were just like, uh, yeah, okay. you don't have to. Uh, he's yeah. uh, still in there. And I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. and he was like, you know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. And uh, you were in House Party 3 that year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, I just showed up on set to say hi. That's how we did it back in the 90s. Hey, mm. back in the day. Yeah. Oh, we got a roll for you. I mean, it was like, hey, you <laughs> yeah, want to be in the scene? That was Chris Tucker's first movie. 
Was he in there? Yeah, he was. In, in yeah. fact, hold on. In fact, yeah. I remember I talked to, to Kid about this. Uh, a bunch of people from House Party 3 pretty much ended up in Friday. Like a lot of the cast yeah. ended yeah. up being in Friday. Right? Because remember, um, yeah. what, what, what was the name of the girl? Uh, Felicia. Yeah. By Felicia was yeah. played the main, Angela you know, it's a good exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Played the main female role and, and, and all that. And like a lot of the characters ended up basically being in Ice Cube's movie Friday. The, the um, that uh, F. Gary Gray and all of us, when we visited scenes back in that day, you did that. Somebody was working, you went on the set. Well, you couldn't get on like Eddie Murphy set, you know, you know all night, stuff like that. But friendly sets where you could, oh, walk up, oh, they're filming over here on Wilshire and drive up. And, and, you would, and then next thing you talk about ideas and put ideas together mm -hmm. because you would have some distributors there and you'd be working on your next project. Because um, John was always working on his next project. Rusty mm -hmm. Cundiff was always working on the next one. So you would kind of meet and they would, hey, you know, you just, that was it back. That, that's how you got your gigs back in the day. You know, you showed up, you had somebody, you, you support somebody's stuff and next thing you know, you're in a movie. Right, and speaking of uh, Rusty Cundiff, the next year, 1995, you're in Tales from the Hood. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is also uh, executive produced by Spike Lee. Yeah. Is that well, your first Spike Lee film? Yeah, Spike never showed up. Spike took the money and ran. <laughs> and I said, where are we going to meet Spike? <laughs> Spike put his name on it. We had to go and sell movies and show up in his little Spike joints and do all the stuff. And I said, where's Spike at? Never Spike Perdue, he ain't never, he ain't went at the premiere, he went at the movie, <laughs> where the, where's Spike? He took out half the money. <laughs> well, thank you, Spike. 40 acres and a meal. Yep, it's good to where, be Spike. Where it's good to be Spike. But that's why I said, <laughs> man, I need, I need one of them Spike jobs. You just show up and just put your name on it and, mm. you know, produce it, but yeah. Well, uh, and then Tupac goes to prison that same year. Yeah, again. <laughs> well, that that was, oh, I mean, again? Which way? Well, Tupac was, was always the, going somewhere. Or this was over the whole uh, so, yeah, the when he went, thing. When he went to, yeah, which was, woo, set up. Did you talk to him leading up to that? I mean, in ter terms of leading up to him going to, to prison over that? No. I mean, not, not like when it comes to what happened. You'd see him. Yeah. And he was like, I used to say he's going to beat that. So when it happened, I was surprised and shocked it happened because it was like, okay, I know that's not Pac. So when I saw him, he would say something like, yeah, I ain't, you know, worry about that. But, but when he went to jail, I, I, I was, that was, but I was like, that's not you. You don't take, he don't take booty. He don't do nothing. Well, but the whole story was he didn't. You just were in the company of supplying why it went down. So, you, got, you know, you got the, your name on it and it happened. And, well, I'm going to keep quiet about, you know. Well, I interviewed uh, Ayanna Jackson, okay. who was the rape accuser. It was her first and only uh, video interview. I mean, she explained what happened. I interviewed her, and I remember I spoke to his co-defendant about it. Yeah. And essentially, the story that she told more or less matched up with what he said, with a few somewhat minor differences. Right. But, I mean, if you look at it through a 2023 lens, you're fucking with a girl, right? It's not your girlfriend, just right. some girl that, you know, she gave you head on the dance floor and y'all right. fucking around or whatever else. And, uh, you know, your homies want to hit. All right. And he's like, all right, well, that's not my girl, y'all, you know? All right. That's what y'all want to do. And she with it, cool. And you walk out and, you know, they do what they do. He's still somewhat responsible right. for this person. That's what I say. He's applied to opportunity. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not like he was totally, innocent. like, totally innocent. You know what I mean? Depending on how you look at it, it's like, look, this person's here for you. You know, and a lot of girls are cool with that. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot yeah. of cool, a lot of girls are cool with fucking with the whole crew, but not every girl is like that. And especially right. these days, you got to be extra, 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 extra careful. Who you tell me? You know, I think that if this happened in 2023, you'd probably get the same result. You know what I'm saying? And I think Pac learned a very valuable lesson, you know, when it comes to dealing with these types of situations. But he was a young guy and you know what I'm saying? Like a lot of stuff probably went down like that and everyone walked yeah. away happy. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that, sense, that, to him, it's probably just another night. I Another mean, night. hanging in strip clubs, Magic City days, the the, yeah. the the just out having women come back to your hotel and you think everything is cool and it's like, it may it's not, not cool. be like you think it is. And, it may know. not be. Yeah, you got to be and, extra and, careful. And, re and re respect to her. I've never met her, never heard her story. I was yeah. supposed to meet her one time, like after that, actually. You were supposed um, to meet her? Oh, why? 
No, somebody was telling me I was in New York going to party. They were saying, bye, 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 bye. I'm just going to be here. We're going to kick it with them. And by the way, this is the person that did that. And I was like, for real? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, well, we don't need to meet them. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. I was like, no, I'm good. We ain't got to go to that party. But to me, and this was not, and the case hadn't been closed or nothing yet. So it was mm -hmm. like, at the time, people were still living their lives because you just, because for real. And, you know, God forbid that anybody takes advantage of of their career like that, that it's like in going 15 seconds that you just, I'm just into the moment because mm -hmm. you just can't live in the moment no more. Yeah, you got to think ahead. Because it may not be somebody else's moment. Got to think ahead. Uh, you actually put money on uh, Pox Books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was he... Yeah, because he actually was Everyone, having some money problems back then. Because I guess the the money hasn't... What, some of the money hadn't really caught up, I guess. It was the, the movie money and the music money and everything. Because I remember like he was even talking about how he was... Well, he was in prison with the number one uh, album in the country. Because Dear Mama was on there. But, I mean, he was the lawyer fees. The lawyer fees, yeah. yeah. Had to eat him up. Yeah. Like, come on, man. Keep yeah, he was fighting man. multiple cases. The, 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 More you know, than just the two one. cops, mm -hmm. the two white cops in Atlanta that he shot, mm -hmm. which he got off for. I mean, in the Oakland thing, that situation, that was before. Um, oh, yeah, the little kid died, yeah. Whatever that happened, because yeah, he was yeah, losing yeah. his hair and he was going through that coming when he was doing Tupac. I mean, when he was doing Poetic Justice, yeah. he was kind of losing his hair and kind of, he's biting his nails. You could tell he was going through a little anxiety and stuff. Yeah. He was real, and we were like, what's out. up with that? And his hair was falling out. Yeah. Uh, he had patches. 21. Well. Yeah, but now that you look back, you're like, oh, that's what that was. Stress. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I interviewed your uh, your brother, Guy. Mm -hmm. And the two of you have a very interesting relationship, to say the least. <laughs> um, you know, I watched an interview this morning. You know, Guy said, uh, I don't like him, but I love him. All right. Uh, I guess he referred to you as a narcissist. Um, where are you guys right now? I, we, we're good. We always yeah. we're always good. Guys, my little brother. So you know, whatever he says, whatever he you know, he, what, I always tell people this: like whatever he's going through, that's in his head. <laughs> it's not in my head. And because he won't, I won't accept what's in his head. He, I'm a narcissist. He won't accept. I'm like, I don't want to hate you. I don't want to be mean to you. I don't want to be. I don't live like that. I don't. I can't stay mad at the world or somebody for too long. I may have my moment with it, and it's gone. But sometimes it may be a, enough where it's you know it's in your entrenched into your soul. And I think that's he gets a lot of that big brother stuff because I ran through a lot of doors, and you know I didn't I didn't really care. And I, you know, and then with him looking like me and coming up in the Tory name, mm -hmm. like my sister and my father had a great name. First of all, father, mother, my mother taught for 40 years, a Tory name is whatever it is. And then my sister, and so we, you know, she was educator, track star, so, and then when you heard my name, it was like, okay, that's little Tory's brother, because I was getting into trouble. He's good, but he, he's doing this. He's good, but he's beat somebody up. He's good, but he, you know, so, because my sister was straight A, you know, you know, hallelujah, kumbaya. I was like, okay, I'm gonna try the system. Guy didn't never want to be caught up in it like that. Little Tory, that's Joe Tory. He's gonna be something like that. He's gonna be. So he always tried to avoid, you know. Um, he, he first got into business. I'm the world famous guy T. Didn't even want to use Tory. Uh, he didn't go to the same um, college. Could have went to my college. Where I went. He went to another college, trying to make his own name for himself. So he just been living in the little brother shadow for since I gave the Tory that celebrity name. And uh, you know, that's in his head and not in mine. I love him. Well, he's done very well for himself. Yeah, American he should have had better. <laughs> I practically, I practically handed Hollywood to him. <laughs> How do you fuck that up? You get out here, Ooh, okay. you get out here, you have nothing but, hey, you no rent, no, you got your car. I tell people, when you come out here, have some transportation and, you know, and find a church home, a Bible or something, but you got to believe in something other than um, the evilness that you're going to run into because you're going to mm -hmm. run into a lot of negativity. So you don't have transportation and you don't have some place where you meditate and you grab and you have another hero besides what somebody's telling you, you know what I'm saying? Get out of here because you're not prepared for it. Yeah. So with that, you know, you, and you don't have to pay nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you get a job, like every, uh, you can see him, he's my extra or he's my stand in or he's mm. got a job with Martin and you know, on the set where you know, hey, you're delivering the scripts, next thing you know, you're writing and you're on the episode. So it's like, mm -hmm. you, and then I put you on Def Jam, put you on tour, put you, so it's like, you know, this is what you do. This is what you, this is. Come on, man. This, this is the favor that was given to me. Um, 
I just tried to hand down to him, just like he did with everybody else. And Robin Harris showed me, what I showed Jamie, what I showed a lot of them, Steve Harvey, you know, mm. before Steve got out, Bernie Mac, a lot of them. They didn't, they didn't have the cadence, so it was like, okay. I mean, listen, he did Life, and yeah. of course, Fat Tuesdays no. ended up being a launching pad for a lot of people. You know, I saw the documentary recently. Uh, you know, yeah, man, he's done. He's done well for himself. Man. He, he, he's dead good. Whatever you see, this through you see Fat Tuesdays, and, and everybody's like, "Well, where's what happened to the, the thirty years? How you get there?" And and that's the road, the the, mm -hmm. the Robin Harris road, the road that made that possible for Fat Tuesdays when they wouldn't come to the comedy store and we couldn't go up there. You know what I'm saying? So that playing field. Like I said, that you had to go through, you know, it was like, man, we made it a lot easier for that to happen. He did a lot with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people on, a, on that platform kind of, you know, kind of kept the door open. Because I got tired of Hollywood. I was, I was burnt out. I moved to Atlanta, New York. I get burnt out of just, you know, doing the movies, going through the bullshit. And Bobby Brown and, and Tupac was in Atlanta. So I was like trying to move down there and make a, a Hollywood out of Atlanta. Well, the next year, 1996, uh, Pac gets out of prison mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, well, he wasn't fully out. He was on bail mm -hmm. because I guess he, was, he got the retrial. Right. And he comes out and he just wiles out. The, the East Coast, West Coast beef officially was launched. Hit him up comes out. When you first heard hit him up, <laughs> That's why I fucked your bitch, you fat motherfucker. Oh, like, well, California, like, love California. You know, no. all that. He came out because you know, yeah. All eyes on me was a on. hell of an album. It was mm. uh, people that say, I say, what do you do when you lock somebody up? You lock a genius up mm -hmm. for two years. What did he? What are you, what are you gonna do? You lock Elton John in a closet. You, you lock somebody famous. You know, you musically print somewhere in the house where you can just get it in and all that stuff. Would keep, man, they locked him down where. Man, he just saw who loved him, who didn't. He saw the world like mm -hmm. in, in a short amount of time, and um, I mean, he, like I said, he was he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He lived in the wrong era. Well, yeah, I mean, he understand too. Much. Everything is going crazy, you know. There's the beef with Biggie and yeah. everything else like that, and then in Las Vegas at the MGM, and I've dug very deep into the story with most of the players involved in it. Um, you know, the guy gets jumped, uh, you know, they try to take, you know, Trayvon Lane, they try to take his chain, mm -hmm. they're at the MGM, and they see uh, Baby Lane, and Trayvon's like, oh, that's the guy that jumped me. Pac took it among himself, and the same big brother thing that you're talking about, yeah. he yeah. took it upon himself to run up to this guy and punch him in the face. Saw that, like this guy is a known Southside Crip, he's being investigated for multiple murders at the time, Pac has a bunch of guys with him, Buntry and Suge and everything. There is no reason why Pac needed to be the guy that beelines right. and starts to, to, to attack the guy. But he did. Right. And then the guy gets jumped. I interviewed Keefe D. Do you mm -hmm. know who that is? Yeah, I know Keefe. I don't know, I don't know him like you know. Yeah. yeah. So we went into the whole story where basically he confirmed that after, uh, you know, Orlando gets jumped, they basically get a bunch of guns and go looking for Pac and Suge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Keefe's the last person in that car who's still alive. Right. And he basically says that, yeah, they pulled up and just opened fire. Uh, Suge gets hit in, in the head and Pac, uh, Pac gets killed. Right. Um, I interviewed uh, Chris Carroll, who was the first responder that showed up to the scene. And, uh, you know, he didn't know who any of these people were. He right. just saw a bunch of guys, there's bleeding yeah. and there's gun, you know, bullets everywhere and everything else like that. And uh, what he said was really interesting. He said that, um, you know, when he opened the car door, you know, Pac fell out, you know, and he's got, he's covered in blood and everything else like that. And, you know, the police officer, Chris, was trying to get what he calls a death confession, saying, who, who did this to you? Who, right. who was the one that shot you? And Pac is still like in a daze, but then when he finally realized that it's a cop yeah, that's yeah. talking to him, he said, fuck you. Yeah. And he slipped into a coma. And those were his last words. I looked at him and I, I said, you know, what happened? Who shot you? Who did this? You know, what's going on? And he's just really just kind of ignoring me. He's not even, you know, even though I'm right there holding him, he's just kind of not acknowledging my presence. And he's trying to yell back at Suge. Well, I turned around, uh, 
at Suge, and that was the first time I noticed I saw the back of another bike officer, and he was pushing Suge away from me, and that's the first time I realized there's other cops there, so that made me feel a lot better. So he kind of pushes uh, Suge back, and uh, Suge is still yelling, pack, pack, he's trying to yell at him, and then I saw Tupac just, all of a sudden, it just in an instant, he went from trying to, you know, kind of squirming, looking at Suge, trying to get the words out to where you could tell he physically just gave up. He just wasn't able to do it. And he just, he just crossed that line into just quitting and being at peace. And he just kind of laid back and was calm and was no longer looking or trying to do anything. And uh, I could just see it, it uh, that he was just, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, almost like, an athlete or a runner when they hit that wall and it's just like it's over and you could see you could see that in his face and uh, I looked at him once again I said what happened who did this who shot you and now he's looking at me so we're looking at each other in the eyes and this is kind of the first time he's even acknowledging my presence and uh, he looked at me and I could tell he was you know he was getting a breath together to tell me and he looked me right in the eyes and we looked at each other and he said fuck you, and he said it just like that, with an emphasis on that F to, you know, to really let me know uh, that's how he felt. So uh, he said that, and right after he said it, he kind of, he just kind of started, you know, started gurgling, and uh, you could tell he was in bad shape, and his eyes, he's starting to lose consciousness then, and his eyes roll back. And as it turns out, that would be his last conscious moment and his last words. You heard that before? Yeah, exactly. That's I heard. That's yeah. I have, there's been no detours from that story as far as, uh, you know, I mean, to me, I mean, yeah, I mean, when I heard it, but you also thought he was going to live. Everyone thought he was nah, going to live. Nah. Like, in fact, I remember uh, I lived in the Bay Area at the time, and uh, DJs were kind of cracking jokes about it. Like, oh, yeah, Pac lost a lung. He's going to be one lung Shakur. And mm. like, you know, people were kind of making light of it. In fact, mm. your brother actually uh, made a joke about it. We right. talked about this. Uh, you know, Guy Tory on stage was like, he said, oh, he they weren't trying to kill Pac. They were trying to kill that that dude who had the bad, like, you know, national anthem, oh. <laughs> like, song, you know, or, or some shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, because when he got shot, everyone just assumed yeah. that he would live because Pac seemed invincible. He got he shot. He did. You know, and he'd make a song about it. Now, him and Bobby Brown back in the day, he was like, something's going to happen, they'll get out of it. Yeah. It was like they're the invincible guys. And Pac was like, you you thought that. And uh, we didn't that time. Because um, it was a friend of mine that, that um, that picture, that last infamous picture that is there, a friend of mine, friend took that picture. Yeah, he he sent me, I know, I know what you're talking about, he actually sent me a copy yeah. of that and picture. And I was like, and this was before Pac had died. Yeah. I was like, and it was like, yo, that's a picture. That's Because that picture was everywhere. Yeah. And it was like, he said, like, hey, that's my boy. And I'm like, but you would think, <laughs> That okay, he went home, changed clothes, and next thing you know, he was out. But I saw Pac like two weeks before that um, at the comedy store. And back when Pac start, started hanging with you, it was, you know, the, the thing was different because he was, you know, Pac, Pac was always his own guy. Come and go when he, want, when he wanted to. When he was with Suge, it was always the point where, okay, you know, because I was like, where you at? We, House of Blues. I think um, one time it was, uh, um, Lauren Hill, uh, the, uh, the whole, that whole South, the outcast, all of them were performing, and he was late. And I was like, where you been, man? Where you been, man? He was like, man, sure, get him, man, had me over here. Sure, get him, man. He was kind of like he wasn't his own guy anymore. He was with the crew. And, you know, so it was like, you never had permission to talk to Pac. Every time he came in, he was like this, or sure, he was looking to vet in the room or something. It was like, come on, I'm talking about knowing Pac before you knew Pac. So it was like, I was always good, but it was a whole nother attitude. So at the comedy store two weeks before that, it was like maybe, um, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 Crips crossed the street. And we were about to go over to the Hyatt and I was going to roll over there with him like we was going to hang out. And Pac was like, no, 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 y'all go out of here. And that's was with Monica Calhoun. I think Vivica was going, we was about to go hang with them. Like, what's the thing? And he was like, no. And that's the last time I saw him. He was like, and he looked. He never told me. He was like, no, man, I, I deal with this. And I was like, and he was just staring at a whole other crew across the street. Like, and I was like, and he was like, you know, it was kind of like, it was, he's like, this is my life now. Yeah. And I'm like, because he never rolled like in a posse that big. It was Emo Prime. Um, 
and not even maybe somebody else, but when he came, when he came, and none against sugar, no sugar, you know, it's, it's been no sugar, sugar, and we always had great conversations. Uh, he always gave me great advice. So you thought he was in the, you know, the great situation where, you know, you, nothing's gonna happen to him. And, uh, but it, it was definitely to the point where he couldn't make his own decisions anymore by himself. And that was kind of a frustrating thing. Yeah, I remember uh, I watched some documentary, I think Shock G said something to the effect of Pac and Suge's relationship was basically Suge held him down like Pac always wanted someone to hold him down. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. like Suge basically said, do whatever you want and I'll deal, I'll clean up the mess afterwards. You know, because he had this huge group of bloods Right. You know, I mean, Mob James is a, is right. a regular guest on my right. show, and he basically brought a lot of these early guys in yeah. and, and kind of set up this whole kind of thing where it was just like, yeah, Pac had the outlaws, he had Thug Life. You know, he 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 always had he always had guys with him, but now he had an actual army of dudes right. that were ultra violent. And he was, but he was never with a gang. He was like, he was, right. cool. I was like, what are you? What are you? What do you do? You don't. You're not with any gang, right? But he ended up getting a mob tattoo. Yeah. So. Yeah, but see what I mean? Yeah. Sorry, but but I'm like, and, cause why? Why you get caught up in that whole in that whole thing? I mean, it's alluring, yeah. you know. It's why you see people like Chris Brown and Lil Wayne becoming bloods after they become millionaires and yeah. stuff like that. It's it's a it's an alluring. Yeah, you thing. know what? It, it could be a brotherhood thing, and it's also a brotherhood. A brotherhood thing. thing. I mean, cause I know yes. a lot of a lot of people come back to my fraternity. They say, "Oh man, it seems like a great brotherhood," and so it's like being part of a big army or a family that you know that has your back and protects you everywhere. But you know, you really got to have your soul and your interests at heart. Well. Yeah, yeah, man. You you see, you see lots of situations, man. You see, yeah. you know, you you fast forward to like you know a couple of years ago, you know, King Von, mm. who got killed, basically. In a similar situation, he goes and sees someone he doesn't like, starts punching him. His man yeah. pulls out a gun and kills him, and then a shootout occurs. Other people die, and so forth. And it's just a lot of it is just like unnecessary situations that you're riding for your friends, and but you're but you're the star, like you're yeah. the, you know, I mean, you're the money guy. Yeah. You're the one that everyone should be protecting and staying out the way. In the same way that you say how Janet Jackson's crew didn't want her to, <laughs> to no. kiss anyone and get sick, like they, they there should have been someone there that. At the point that he started running over there, they should have just grabbed him and like, nah, like. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a, there's a famous story with them um, when Pac was doing um, Poetic and uh, somebody's gangbang was messing with him. My, my Angelo and everybody was out there and he was about to go whoop him up. I basically had to pick Tupac up and carry him really? to the trailer. He was the movie, yeah, it was my Angelo, Robbie Reed's mother. And the guy just kept messing with him, calling him Tupac, kept doing this. He was an extra, but he was a gangbanger or something. He kept yeah. messing with him. And I said, all you had to do was tell somebody to get him removed from the set, you know, because they had, you had like maybe 50 extra people out there, like were just in the park as bystanders. And I literally had to put him over my shoulder <laughs> just because he was going. I He was really going. I carried him, picked him up, and John, Don Wilkerson, he was the first AD. A lot of them, they were like, yo. But I, my thing was, First of all, that's my Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a fuck who you are. That's everybody. Grandma, you about to right. go wild well, on. Well, the whole film was it. based around her poems, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, she was a big involvement of it. Exactly. exactly. But, yeah. you know, but I'm like, yo, but, you know, this is, this ain't the, you know, we ain't, we ain't over there in the barbershop, but beauty shop scene. This is, there was a big scene and it was like, you know. Yeah. No, I interviewed uh, Khalil Kane. They were talking about doing, you know, they're working on Juice. Yeah. Uh, I guess like, you know, they're letting some little, you know, local dudes hang out. One of them ended up stealing something and yeah. pocketing them and ended up beating them up yeah. Yeah. on the set. That. Yeah. And, and I think that there was like, I think a shooting may have occurred because of that or some shit. Like it, I think it, they it, came by and something happened on the yeah, set. Yeah, yeah. Like and, I'm saying, yeah. like Pac is, this is almost like regular for him to do this yeah. type of shit. This is like... I mean, that, yeah, it was it was you expected it to kind of happen, kind of. If you, you know, I'm from St. Louis, so it's like, yeah, gunshots, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, you know, it's just a regular day at the office, <laughs> but you know, nah, you got to change that. Uh, well, uh, in 1986, you were in Fled, yeah, with uh, Lawrence Fishburne and uh, Stephen Baldwin. Yeah, man. Next year, you were in Back in Business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brian Bosworth. Yeah. Brian Bosworth. Yeah. Uh, and then you were also in Sprung. That was the standout, I think, out of the out of the yeah. films I just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, With, uh, yes. Tisha Campbell, Paula J. Parker, and yourself. John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon, of course. Sprung was dope. Clarence Williams the third. 
Yep. Yeah, man. When you guys made Sprung, did you think it was going to be something special? Nah, not really. Really? I, they told me not to do it. My agents were like, nah, you don't want to be this silly. You're going toward dramatic stuff. They knew your comedian is too wacky. And I was like, well, this is a, this, what are you talking about? This is great. This can show my range. And it was like, yeah, yeah, he's going you know, to ruin your career. And I'm like, ruin your career? Yeah, shit like that. I was like, really? <laughs> I was like, no, nah, this, this is fun. This is, you can show, I don't, don't want to be the angry guy all the damn time. You know what I'm saying? You just show my range. And, and it was it was a good movie. I learned a lot from um from Tisha and Paula and from and from John. Just being John and Clarence Williams the third. I had moments just to get pick his brain about. Even though he wasn't he was in Tales in the Hood, but um I, I had a better relationship where he could he, he you know, by the time we did uh Sprung, because he pulled a shotgun on me, it was like I mean, he was like, but just being on set and him telling me stuff to this day, I, I never forget. Well, uh in ninety-nine. Uh, kid from Kid and Play, we did an interview, and he yeah. said that you guys were in the car together when things went terribly wrong. So, you know, we're in the car, we're blazing, we got the tunes playing and shit, and we're just, you know, reminiscing and just having a good time. And I'll never forget, he was coming down, came down La Cienega, and made a right on Wilshire. So we made a right on Wilshire, we're headed toward my hotel. So technically we're in, you know, we're in Beverly Hills, you know what I mean? We're in, we're in a nice part of town. So we're just driving slow. There's nobody really on the road. It's, it's after two. And um, we're just, you know, we're just chilling. And it was weird because I don't know if you've ever driven and you and you feel somebody just come up alongside of you, you know, as you're driving, but they don't pass you. They're just kind of abreast of you. You know what I mean? So, and and I kind of, I kind of felt that. You know, I kind of felt that. And I look over here and there's like this dark colored car uh, riding alongside of us. And it's tinted windows I can't really see, but I see the, the window come down on the passenger side. I see the window come down and I see the barrel of a gun. And I'm like, oh shit. And next thing you know, pow, 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 pow. Bullets flying all throughout the car. I'm, I'm ducking down like this. I could have swear I could have, they're going everywhere, like several shots. And Joe almost loses control of the car, but he, but he manages to, to um, you know, maintain control of it. You know, he almost, you know, dang, and smashed in some parked cars or whatever like that. And he says, yo, what the fuck? I'm going to go, what the fuck? And he got shot in the arm. Oh. And this is back when Joe was like cock diesel, right? And the bullet that like went right through his arm, like zap, boom, bap. He was like, oh, shit. And he's thing, and now we don't know what to do. And we look around, and the car that had come alongside of us and shot at us had done a, peeled out, did a U-turn and, and sped, sped off. You know, because I didn't know, like, you know, they could maybe finish us off. I don't know. We never quite figured out what the fuck happened. Yeah, terribly wrong. Friday night, 99. I'm taking, I hadn't seen Kid in a minute. He comes from Richard Pryor's birthday party. Mm. Picked him up and we were hanging out later. And I'm never hanging out late on a Friday night because I'm never in L.A. And I was kind of going through a transformation. I wasn't smoking weed, drinking. I had no guns on me. I wasn't rolling like that no more. And I picked up Kid, and I was telling him all about that stuff. We were coming from, um, you know, off of uh, Sunset, and down La Cienega, and then we turned over on Wilshire, and next thing you know, blah, 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 I was getting lit up. Looked over, and it was, you know, a guy hanging out the window with a gun, and he, nine, hit me, hit me in the arm, hit me on my finger. Um, this side, seven shots they found, you know, that was hit the car, hit the truck. Huh. And I just got hit in the arm and went through. But Kid was over there screaming like he got hit like a little bitch. And I'm like, what the hell are you screaming for? No, man, are they shooting at? I'm like, are they shooting at you? Because I don't- shoot at both of y'all, actually. I mean, you guys are both nah, in the car. Both in the car. But yeah. I'm like, where are we coming from and who's after you? And, you know, I just went over to see a side and, I, and that's when I knew I was hit. Because I didn't know I was hit until actually I got um, a couple blocks away. And then I was like, somebody said, we see blood. And I said, this is blood. And I had on, I think I had on some gray slacks. And I said, some blood somewhere. And it was, and I had on a black sweater. So then I was like, oh, shit, it's me. Okay. So from what Kid said, to this day, he has no idea what happened. We don't know what happened, man. I think we were mistaken identity. Huh. Um, and back that time, like 99, I know they used to have this thing, gang initiation the first week of December, because it was that Friday. Hmm. All trap was letting out. Now, that's the only thing I can put it on, because nobody was after me. I was at the comedy store that Monday. I'd been out Tuesday. I went somewhere that Friday. I'd been out. So I was like, and I think it was mistaken identity, which was a lot of, I noticed a lot of black blazers that look alike hmm. back in that time. But then the police said it was some um, 
I don't know, if it was whatever cameras or whatever they got from that gas station, they said it was some Aryan Nation shit. I thought it was some Hispanics because I thought I saw a plaid shirt. But they said it was like some Aryan Nation well, I mean, kid from Kid and Play is a notorious gangster himself. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, he's got like four or five bodies that I know of. So <laughs> that's what it's probably like, meant for him. I'm like, I'm with the, I'm with the nicest guy in rap. I know, right? <laughs> How the hell am I getting shot at? <laughs> what the? And I and I and I left him alone for a long time. I was like, oh, you ain't with I no said, fuck with you, dude. <laughs> okay, so you got shot in your arm and your side. No, I got shot. No, I got. I could have got shot in my side. I got shot in my. I got. I hit my arm, and and it blew a piece of my top of my pinky off over here. But no, the bullet. It was luckily it was a bullet that could have hit me right here, and it was stuck inside that little thing that uh, to make the window go up and down. Hmm. It, boom, it was right there. It blew my back off. Okay, but you got hit in the arm. I hit in the arm. Yeah. So they had to pull the bullet out. No, it went or through. It went, it went through. through. Yeah. Okay. I didn't. I didn't know I was hit. Was that the only time you ever got shot? Yeah, yeah, and and, and got hit. <laughs> or you been yeah. shot at before? <laughs> shot at before. Yeah. Okay, but that was the first time you got hit. Yeah, that's the first time I got hit. So did you go straight to the hospital? Yeah, you went straight to Cedar. Okay. Yeah, it was in the wisher and was kind of just turned and was like, "Yo, where do we go?" The police showed up and you had to fill out a report and yeah, whatever else. Yeah, but you were like, out. "I don't, I don't know what happened." So we were like. You know, I don't know. We were just riding and drive by. Somebody just drove by and shot us. And they were like, eh. they, and it was funny because they were asking us all crazy ass questions like, what'd you guys do? Where are you coming from? Where you belong to? We're just like, <laughs> what set you from? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> this is fucking kid from Kitty Play. <laughs> but he wasn't shot. So they were looking at me and my, I was, man, I was huge. I didn't even know it. And it was like, man, you an athlete or something? You, you're, you're, you're. My heart level was, was cool and calm, but. At that time, I didn't know. That was just another wild night in L.A. to me. And I got caught up in it. You know what I mean? So I don't think nobody was. I didn't feel nobody was after me. And nothing happened since. I, I, I heard what you said. No, you take somebody's girl. They do something. I'm like, what the fuck? I don't know, man. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't do that. I don't mess with nobody's, nobody's girl. Man. Yeah. It, it wasn't that. We still don't know where that came from. I don't know what it was. And, uh, you know. It, you know, for a while I was like, oh man, do I go outside? Who's after me? But it's kind of getting shot at for a while. It will make you, you know, rethink your steps and choices and where you go out. And um, that's why I really don't go out in LA, especially now on Friday nights. Yeah. Because, you know, mistaken identity, people following you home. Mm. stuff And stuff like that was happening back in the day. I, maybe I was a little too flashy. They thought I could shoot me and jack me. I don't know. Yeah, that's why I live in a gated community, man. You're not following me home. But <laughs> that happened on Wilshire and Beverly Hills. I know, right? They can catch me. Yeah, I mean, they yeah, can catch me driving like, around. What the hell, I, I got man. you. That's why I have tinted yeah. windows, I guess. Like, huh. you don't know but I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, come on, you were kid and play. Yeah. You're 99, you're driving, you're catching up. You know, you, you, you just came from a Bill Maher party. Bill Maher, Richard Pryor, Eddie Griffin, we laughing, we're catching up. Because kids stayed with me for a while. And I was like, you got mail over my house. You, you're staying at the, uh, he was staying at the Beverly Hills Hilton. And next thing you know, pop, 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 pop. And I'm like, what the hell? So, and then for real, I didn't, I didn't, I don't, have I written with him since? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> That next year in 2000, you were in lockdown, which was yeah, produced by Master P. Master P, baby. Was Master P involved in it? Yeah, he was involved. He was, you know, you had, you had, your, you had your good involvement and you had your bad involvement. You know what, <laughs> what, I'm what was the good and bad involvement? You, in had your, you had your, before Master P showed up, you know, we were 40, 52 set up today, knocking them down. Master P showed up, seven, eight. If he showed up, he wanted to direct, he wanted to do this scene, still in scene, this scene. He, was just, he just showed up with his whole crew being Master P, which is he Master P. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see now he was coming with influence, but I guess if he didn't put his mark on stuff back then, um, when you see people, you know, okay, this is him, but okay, this is how we do it. But he was trying to direct, and do it, and produce, and yeah, yeah, did we, did he, cause us some days on the movie? Yeah. Did he make some people scared on the movie? <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> he was scaring he people was, on set. He was intimidating, man. Not me. I wasn't intimidated. I mean, he is pretty tall. He was like 6'5 or something like that. that and he got a whole crew with him, I the guess. The crew was intimidating. The crew was intimidating, not him. Okay. I mean, yeah. It was, you know, they were showing up. You know, you know, their jokes was like, yeah, okay. Uh, I grab and fuck you in your ass in the back. What you gonna do? Uh, you wanna fuck me in the big motherfucker? Got you, 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 you. We gonna do to you? I used to be like, yeah, why y'all got fuck you in the ass stories? Like, yeah, I'm from a jail. Yeah, we just got it out. I was like, oh, okay. 
I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was always, uh, you know, yeah, we, what you going to do if we do this shit to your story? I'm like, uh, I don't do shit. You better take that to them. <laughs> Cliff Powell, Bill Nunn, but it's all we had jokes and we just playing with you. you know, it was, so it was intimidation where they like, like they would just take over a set. But it was always some Louisiana gangster jail, what we'd do to your ass type shit. <laughs> and it had my man uh, Gabriel Cassis was he was nervous a couple times. He couldn't even act. He was like he was couldn't even remember his lines. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, man, I'm ashamed to couple y'all. I don't feel like, look, y'all ain't talk to me like this. I'm like, oh, yeah. we, and we were in a real prison, too. Right. That real stanky prison where, you know, if you needed to feel an evil soul, it was up in there. Because it was the one they shut down in Santa Fe. Where they they never cleaned it up. It was the one where they, it was a slaughter. And they man, they, you know, this prison took over and they killed everybody, shot them up. And we had to go in there every day. And what, what's his name was in there, too? Um... DeAndre Bonds. DeAndre Bonds. Woo! I got so much content on him. Well, yeah, I did an interview with him. Yeah, he's come a long way. Uh, he got raped. In, in the in the movie. In the movie, yeah, in the movie. Not, not in real life. <laughs> not in real life. Not in real life. In life. But, but we actually talked about it. He didn't want to do the scene. Nah, man. Nah, the man. director convinced him to do the scene. Yeah. He said after the scene was done, he went back to his dressing room and cried. He did, yeah. He didn't want nobody on the scene. Um, and my man, um, Lush, uh, the director, John, great director, great. He did Takers. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, he had the moment. And he, he, he made it very comfortable for DeAndre. That film would have been a whole other way if he didn't direct it. And it could have been a whole other way if Master P let him direct it like he wanted to. Master P, easy. That's my boy, though. But anyway, I mean, at the time, um, DeAndre, man, if you want to see one of the most, some of his acting ability, that was right there before he. Uh, because he didn't want, nobody was supposed to be on the set in that scene that he was doing it with. And then the actor that was with him, I mean, that's, uh, that, was a, that was a real intimidating scene, man. I, don't, I couldn't have done that scene. I'm going to tell you right now. Nah. Yeah, I mean, have there been scenes along the way where you were like, nah, I'm not doing this? Yeah, there's a lot of scenes. I don't, I don't. Well, give me an example of a scene that you just refused to do. Um, you ain't putting your balls and dick in my face. I, just, <laughs> I ain't what? kissing another man. Wait, I mean, hold on. What, yeah. what movies were you supposed to get? No, it's balls a, lot of, a lot of things where you wear. I mean, well, it was another. It's some other films where, like, um, uh, Mansfield 12 or something, you got to be naked in the cell and doing things. And But I'm like, you know, I'm not. If that scene is not important to the story in the movie, I'm not doing it. Or if I don't think that, you know, I'm the right guy for it, I don't, I don't want that on film. But is this. Before you even take the role, or after the movie's already? Oh, this is before filming. I take it. I'm okay, not, so you yeah. would go through the script yeah. and say, "No, nah, I'm not. I'm not going to do this." Oh, we're not going to do that. We, oh, okay, we, I'll, we take, get, I'll do the movie, but we're just not going to. Well, do this we're going to. Yeah. yeah. What, what's your point of doing this? Because some people, yeah. I need to see a ball smack you in the eyes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, you, you go get stunt eyes because they ain't going to be eyes. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Is that really important? <laughs> You're so. <it's> like, <laughs> I want to zoom in on your lips, just percolating on the balls and the motion. Yeah, I mean, you get somebody that like that. <laughs> Were you asked to wear dresses and, and play gay roles in certain movies? No, never. I I, uh, I had to, you know, come in and ask for an audition. Would you play this character? Where um, before? And then, you know, it was like okay. I, sometimes you challenge yourself to like he was um what was he? But I auditioned for it, and I was like, "Yeah." It was like one of those roles where he was going through something. He was the guy who was this, and he had schizophrenic. And he, one day he wanted to dress up like a woman and drive down a thing, and I was like, "But it showed a range of character. He wasn't that person." And I said, "Okay, I'll do that." But he's not a, you know, he's not. I can play other roles in that because you have people that are better actors that can really take it on. You know, Miguel Nunez. You know, he played a whole woman being jump on a man. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's well, like, and he played a gay character in life. Played gay character in life. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, to me, I'm like, I don't. Why you have to get somebody to stretch when you already have somebody that's right there? <laughs> well, but I've, you know, hey. Miguel Nunez actually pulled it off pretty well. But, but, and, and he yeah. and he's like, I mean, we interviewed him. You know, Lunell did the interview for us, but like, I mean, he he's a straight. You know, he's a straight man. Straight, straight man, but a yeah. veteran actor. Been doing this stuff since what was it? Um, He's been TV movies. What was that little movies? Come not a TV show, something Palm Beach or something like that. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, yeah. I mean, Miguel's what sixty? 
He's 180, Something, I think. Exactly. Right? Like, Looking that good. That motherfucker does not age. Eddie Murphy, what the yeah. Fuck? He's one of my good friends. He <laughs> can play anything, you, yeah. any, play anything you, you show him up for. Yeah, no, listen, yeah. when he's not stealing groceries at the Ralph's, I mean, he's really yeah. like... Uh... Yeah. I think he was... <laughs> he's I really think, uh, in his I, bag. I, I, right? think, I think he thought he was playing, you know, he was Donald Trump at that time. I can just like, walk out of here and nothing's going to happen to me. <laughs> yeah, okay. You come back in here. You was Miguel Nuez. You going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, TMZ. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, that was a good one. The line was too long. <laughs> the line was too long. <laughs> I already got That's why I didn't pay for my, my groceries. <laughs> uh, you at least get on that your credit card, right? <laughs> well, uh, in 2009, there was a situation with a female comedian, uh, mm -hmm. Vanessa Fraction. Right. Uh, she, she did an interview, I think, on Comedy Hype. I guess you guys were on tour in Japan. Yeah, I joined the tour. Yeah, we, we went on tour. I went and helped to join the tour. And can you talk about what happened? Uh, no, nah, I mean, I because I mean, she's not here, and I don't like you know poking bones and everything like that. Because it seems like you know we got over it, but when it comes up, it kind of bothers her. Mm -hmm. But we have you know we made amends. That's just a, that's just a, something that just got out of hand, and it was really nothing. And when I say really nothing, not as big as it was, because it was. A situation where I was her big brother, and then it turned into like for a week and a half, and then the next day I was like her enemy, and it was a long bad night, and you know, and then, and then it was like like you said, 15 seconds of wrong thinking of going back and forth with somebody and saying something on Japan on a bus moving fast turned into, oh man, you you a woman beater, and I'm like, no, I'm a woman protector, you know what I'm saying? But since that story has been you know recanted, and we've been we talked about it, we've done shows before. And then after that, you know, they was trying to do a little tour. But I think, you know, the way that whole thing was uh, established was um, wrong. Um, and, you know, I think it was, uh, you know, I was exploited for a particular reason. And that person has since apologized. But he was like, I want to break the news first. And I was like, you haven't really confirmed it from nobody. But it's out. So mm. so when they, you know, when they got out there, I think it just got too big for uh, her to control, me to control. And, then, you know, at the time where... I'm, I wasn't the only story in the news that something happened to, you know, you know it was like some, you know, was, uh, this person assaulted a woman, this person assaulted a woman. So it was like on that, you know, okay, why are you in the summer of people, you know, getting into it with a woman? And, you know, it was nowhere near that. Have the two of you actually talked it out? And Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, a couple of times from from people who know her from Chicago, from Deion mm -hmm. Cole to D. D. Ray Davis to even Corey Holcomb to either other female comedians and promoters. You know, they say we have a whole both sides of stories and because we, we know that's not true, but we heard hers and we heard yours. And and then, you know, and I mean, that's that was it. But I mean, you know, there's nowhere in history that I have any, you know, any story like that ever had like that. And you know, I had a foundation. You know, I live for the protection of women. So that was that right there was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with stories like this. They just will haunt you kind of forever. You know, like I had Afro Man here the other day. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm saying he had the situation with the woman on stage. I don't know if you heard about that or not. Right. And uh, he was like, "Yeah, man. Unfortunately, this thing." But that was you visually saw it. You right? visually saw yeah. it. Yeah. This was and then you know the Chris Brown situation. You you saw the pictures. You, you know what I'm yeah. saying? You know, but I mean, so unfortunately, any anything around this when you're a man right. will just haunt you. Well, 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 because I had pictures of her the next day, mm. and doesn't look like she look like she. You know, it, I wake up like that's beautiful. Yeah. So it was you know you know what I mean. So it was like okay, you, where, what do you have to recant that because. To look at it, I mean, really, to do that on a military base? I was interrogated for like two hours. Hmm. And they were like, you sure you don't want to press charges? You, oh, they like, wanted you, you to press charges. They were like, you sure you don't want it? Because the way we get it, it was like, okay, you were just, it wasn't your, it was. And I didn't get arrested. Hmm. And I did, nothing happened. Military, overseas, it's like, come on, man. Yeah. I mean, really, they're not going to let that go. And I, and I do this. I do, I go overseas all the time. So it was like, but you know, if you if you want to go back, not you don't want to throw anybody on the bus because nobody's, you know, that was just a, a bad timing for everybody. Yeah. And I think the mixed emotions, um, situations, and and like I said, she's not here to say this or that, and I don't want to dig nothing up because it's mm -hmm. in the past, and we prayed on it, we got over that. So it's like to me, it's you know, it's a, and I pray on situations like that. If I've ever, you know, planted a bad seed out there, you know. Um, Unknowingly, I, I pray that it's, it's always, you know, uh, brings flowers and it's not, you know, damaging and hurting you for the rest of your life. Well, in 2017, 
you went with Bill Cosby to his first trial. It was his first one? Or when I went to, yeah. Yeah. To, well, you, yeah. you actually were with him, right? You were part of his, <laughs> his crew, kind of. Actually, China. I was in part of the crew. That's what I turned it to, right? <laughs> right. I mean, but that, I mean, I saw a picture. Like, you were actually walking with him. Yeah. You weren't just, you know, in the audience of the yeah. trial. You actually were walking in with him. So this is how that picture happened. Okay. Because, you know, um, I, I wanted to go to a lot of trials. Michael Jackson or D. Simpson, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was asked to go to the Bill Cosby, do I want to come sit into a trial? I was like, oh, hell yeah. I want to see how this is done. And when I, you know, I called my friends who are lawyers and stuff, they said, if you ever have a chance to go to a trial like this, go and just witness so you'll know mm -hmm. what to do, what to say, and how the law can work for you or against you. Mm -hmm. So I was like, yeah, okay, go. And this is Bill. Now, I've always, you know, protected Bill, I guess, on Facebook or something like that. Did he right. do that? Did he, I don't know if he did. I was always one of those cats. So when okay. the call came up for me to say, you want to come? I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go. And you going to say something? Well, no, what I was going to say, well, number one, he's your frat brother. Right. You guys went to the, you know, had the same, we're in the same fraternity. But did you guys really have a relationship before this? No, I mean, apart from you speaking no. about him publicly, did you know each other, talk to each other, anything? No, no. Bill, Bill, Bill Cosby is like one of my idols. It's like Dick Gregory, Elon mm. Bruce, George Carlin, one right. of the famous comedians that have done it all, and yeah. that's how you do it. You know what I'm saying? If you want to, you want to, this is the highest. Who's done it like Bill Cosby? Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. Thank you. So it's like, boom. So taking a page out of his book, I've seen him on Ghost Dad. You know, I've seen him a couple times on the set. I'm um, in some situations, he came to my college to perform, but never hanging out, never to the to the uh, extent of Richard Pryor sitting on the edge mm -hmm. of beds and getting notes. It was always just a respect thing. So I wanted to get, okay, cool. Let me let me see how you handle this part of your career. You've done everything else. If I could be a fly in the, in the courtroom, which I got invited to be, and I never want to go again. <laughs> <laughs> what because you know you can you can you know you can just mess up so much just sitting there breathing farting your phone go off <laughs> coughing not being alert falling asleep i mean it is so much stuff you in the bench is hard so mm. you're sitting there for two three hours can't drink can't water can't move can't do nothing um yeah, it's kind of like you're, you're, like you're in prison yourself and you're on trial and they see everything and you can get a case just sitting in there listening yeah, it I mean, is, listen, it's exhausting and no, going through you. all that. I've been on trials right. before. I, 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 yeah. I feel your pain. Yeah, I mean, and I interviewed Tom Messero, who was his lawyer during that first trial. Oh, that guy was. Talking about the, the guy from yeah, he With was the white hair, the long white hair. Um, no, the one he won. I got. I was on. I went to the one he went. He. he it was. Oh, you, was you like, didn't go to the one that he. Uh, the one he. The one that got mistrial. That's when I. Went yeah, to. I said the first one. Yeah, so that was a little Jew. That was, was, oh, I thought no, it was no, a little no, Italian no, guy. No, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, Tom Messero was was the next one. Okay, you're right. Okay, yeah, yeah. He changed lawyers. The first trial ended up being a mistrial. Cause that lawyer was on it. Yeah. He was like, he was like, oh my God. He was the only, he was, he had everything. He was like a whole show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought I was watching a movie. <laughs> hey man, the best lawyers money could buy. <laughs> no, but he, but, but every, he found everybody wrong. He found people were lying. Mm -hmm. He went back. The only person didn't lie was Bill Cosby. <laughs> 20 years ago, they went back to all the things and said, well, why are you lying here? And why are you lying here? And you said this here. And these are policemen. These are, these are lawyers. These are pe everybody they called up there. He called them in something that, okay, well. Mm -hmm. And they went back on Facebook. You said this. And this, you, and they have stuff that people are really out to get him. So that's why I was thrown out. That's what I saw. Right. Because people were inconsistent <laughs> with their stories. But then there was a retrial in 2018 where he was found guilty. Yeah, I didn't go to that one. When you heard that he was found guilty, what'd you think? I knew he was going to be found guilty when he when they moved um, from one county to another one. Mm. Because it was, and, a new, and then he changed another lawyer because that, that was the whole thing. It was like, okay, you know, to see how justice can be served and moved. Cause I, I went for, I think, two days. Mm -hmm. But um, but before, you know, because my own, you know, I wanted, if I say something on stage, if I say something about Bill Cosby, if I do something about anything about trial, I was there, you weren't. So how are you gonna tell me, and you weren't there? So if I say anything, I took the hit, I went there and saw for myself who was lying, who didn't lie, who told the truth, how this stuff really works, where it was, so you can't say nothing unless you were there. I mean, were you, did you get to know Bill Cosby? Did you guys talk like offline during that time? No, or you no, just no, 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 no. I, I, I went back to the house after that. We yeah. chopped it up. I saw, 
the holy state, first time there. I saw where the account probably could have happened, where it should have happened, where it would have, and all this alleged stuff was there. So I was like, okay, cool. And then he went to sleep. He was he went to sleep like 6.30, 7 o'clock. He was done, and I had the house laughing and just talking to some of, you know, some of the uh, assistants, some of the people that were with him. But, I mean, to be in a moment like that, to kind of see it, you know, and I, you know, I was, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, Man, I don't, I don't know how you can exchange that because it was, you know, his word. And I, I talked to him. I talked to him for like about maybe an hour after that. You know, he's laying in the bed and he was telling me, you know, he, he was like, what did he say? Uh, he said, he said hey, this is what he said. He said, hey, look, don't get yourself involved with my stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's on me. It's all on me. Okay? You came, you see, you saw, but don't back out there. Don't be out there doing what you got to do to ruin you know, your career or whatever like that. He said, if my kids go broke, that's on them. They can get a job at Chick-fil-A. I was good. <laughs> he said that. <laughs> yeah. He said, but don't. And he was like, yeah, he said, I'm, I'm going to be all right. Well, yeah, he, he got found guilty in uh, 2018. I think uh, TMZ caught you at the airport and you're like. Oh, yeah, before or after that, I'm on interview. Yeah. yeah, you said, uh, you know, you, you said that uh, you feel that after this, other people are going to end up getting going down for mistakes they made 100 years ago. Yeah. Because this was a like, damn near 100 years ago. Yeah. And, man, you, and you see, I mean, um, People that have been. Since R. Kelly? Then. Well, that's a different situation. Well, different situation because, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, you got tape, <laughs> you got footage. You got that one tape, yeah. <laughs> you got footage. Well, yeah. You're dumb you enough footage. to film himself. And, yeah, and, you know, and, you, and you've got tons of stories on just that nature of that. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, you know but I mean? to be fair, the number of accusers against Bill Cosby is huge. It's right. a long laundry yeah. list of people. Not to say they're all telling the truth. Right, right. You know what I mean? But like, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of accusations. But it's also, I mean, it's it, weird, it, man. It, like, as a man. Different, it's a different, there's a difference of like, okay, actually seeing a tape of you, yeah. you know, a tape. Right. And then hearing, but, but, hearing remember, but remember in the first trial, the, the R. Kelly tape, basically the girl took the stand and said it wasn't her. And then in the, mm. in the recent trial, she's like, no, actually it was me. So, yeah. I mean, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, man. It's, it's messed up. And look. It's still a disgusting thing. Okay? Yeah. I, I mean, it's, I, I guess the, 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 the hard part, you know, you know, like I said, Tom Messero has been on my show twice. You know, he's the one that ultimately, you know, the first trial that they lost, he was, he was the, I mean, the, 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 the retrial that ended up losing, he was the main lawyer on right. that case. And, uh, you know, we went fully into it. He was also Michael Jackson's lawyer during mm -hmm. the whole, uh, you know, you know, all the accusations that he had. But like, I mean, I'm 49 years old. If you, I've had women hit me on social media and say, hey, remember we went out in the 90s? Yeah. And I'm like, I have no idea who you are. Exactly. I honestly, like, I'm not being funny right now. Yeah. Like, I have no idea who you are. And I'm yeah. not saying we, we didn't go out once or twice, but you know, throughout the hundreds of women that I've seen over the years, like from I, that long ago, I, I simply just don't remember. Right. You know, and, and, and to try to say that something happened back then in the 90s and the 80s, like, who the fuck, you know, the early 2000s, like, there's no cameras, there's no proof of anything, there's no witnesses, it's all like, he did this and, and, and I'm still hurting over this, like, yeah. there was no criminal charges filed within a certain period of time, it, it was just like, there's, there's no this, there's no that, and, you know, and ultimately, you know, I'm not saying that Bill Cosby is guilty or innocent because I wasn't there. But me and Tom Messero, we, we picked that case apart. And what was very clear was that he should not have gone to trial. There was a specific deal in place exactly. by the district attorney that said that he will not be criminally prosecuted for this case. It was set up in a way where the girl could win a civil case. Right. right? And she got her money. She got a lot of money. Got a lot of money. That to me is problematic also. If you cash out and get a bunch of money, and then come back and want to put him in jail after the money's ran out? Well, the, the, in, well if you went in court, it, that was the thing. It was like, okay, he didn't want to be known as a disgusting man. Mm -hmm. So it was like, basically, he, he kind of knew he was in between, oh, okay, what happened and what. He wanted to just pay for tuition. He's like, I can't give you money. I want to pay, I pay for the college. I pay for your grades and mm -hmm. stuff like that, but I just can't give you money, man. And then when that didn't work, it was like, I think she wanted to be a masseuse. She, she wanted to do be for him to finance her manus, her masseuse career after that. But she ended up falling in love with the masseuse or another masseuse, and he was fine. He was like, "Yo," he kept, and then 
when it ran, finally ran out, it was like she tried to come back again. And it was like, and that's where you had yeah. that. But it was like, okay, but you already got paid like two, three, four, five million for, for you know, and that was the thing. So yeah. in court, when I saw stuff, I don't know what they were releasing to the public, but I was like, but okay, this is, you know what really happened. And yeah. everybody know what really happened. And then you got paid for it. Yeah. And then, so, so then who are you now? Are you still in pain now that he went to jail yeah. and now you got more money? Yeah, I mean, How that, you that's, the problem, that's the problem with extortion, man. That, that's why I've always felt like if someone wants to extort me, they can just go ahead and spill it. I, I ain't going to pay well, a penny. You know what I mean? Be, because well, because is, I'll end up having to pay forever. Well, you know what I mean? Is, like, if, I'm cool. If you, to me, it's like well, he got caught up on being, you know, the weed man back in the day or something like that. You know, it was like, you know, if you know somebody had weed, like, oh, who got it? You know, oh, he's, he, you know, he got some weed. You know what I'm saying? So go over there. So... You mean think Tupac and DJ Quick and everybody used to come over to my house and smoke weed. And, you know, I lived, you know, close to Santa Monica. I used to go to the guitar center store. Oh, Joe, around the corner. Come out and smoke some weed. I, a lot of parties. Mm -hmm. A lot of pool parties. People yeah. always smoke a joint. Blah, blah. I've been in the Snoop Dogg circle. I don't know how many times. <laughs> right? Can I go back and say, uh, 2000, 19, whatever, Snoop? <laughs> he tried to rape me. Because <laughs> he got me high in a weed circle. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, that'd be crazy. Like, man, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, man, you don't know what happened after that. And then now you got everybody coming. And not to put Snoop out there, but I'm saying that everybody, you could put many a rapper's name, Diddy, Rick Ross, everybody had big parties now. You big, big parties at your house, big pool parties. Jermaine Dupree back in the day, oh, I used to go to all of them. Basketball players. Now, if you're liable for what somebody drank or smoked and did at the party, are you responsible? Yeah. Right, because... Cosby got found guilty. He yeah. got sentenced to, I believe, three years. And when he went in, uh, I mean, Tom was talking about this, how he had a chance if he did certain classes and said, hey, I admit to being a rapist and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about this, whatever, he could have actually gotten out. Yeah. But he actually refused yeah, to do that. Yeah. He stayed in prison as a very old man during COVID. Yeah. And ultimately, in 2021, he got out. Yeah. Now he has more civil cases against him once again, but I don't think he's facing any more criminal cases. Well, he's thinking about going back on tour too, so. You think he's going to really go back on tour? He said it. That's going to be an interesting crowd. Well, well I, you, I think you still have, you know, he still has audience. I mean, to me, this is one thing I heard um, somebody say. It was like, you know, um, God never stopped making people. And if, you know, and, you know, if eight million people stop liking you, find eight million more. I mean, because they're, they're out there. Because yeah. everybody doesn't, you know, most of the people, do, they just read the headlines. They don't really read, um, or they don't really, you know, read like the fine final print. Yeah. So if the last thing you did was good, or you, that's kind of what they go by. Yeah. I mean, look, at the end of the day, no one really knows what happens, what had happened. I mean, I don't know what happened in the whole Michael Jackson case. Tom Estro was a lawyer yeah. there. Once again, we don't know. There was a lot of inconsistencies in, in, the, in the accuser stories. And uh, ultimately, you know, I mean, and even I remember one of the really interesting things that Tom told me, which, which really, you know, kind of influenced the way I, you know, my approach to this was that before that big trial, mm -hmm. he ended up settling with this accuser. Like this kid claimed that Michael Jackson raped him or whatever, and he wanted, I forgot how many millions of dollars, but the people around Michael Jackson convinced him to pay. Right. He said, listen, just pay this money. You're going to make way more money. He'll put the whole thing behind you and you'll be done. And I remember Tom told him, told me that Michael told him that was the worst mistake of his life. Yeah. Because once he did that, that opened the door to everyone who had ever met him saying that their kids were molested by Mike. And it started and then, a yeah. whole it thing that a... even continued after his death. Yeah. And the whole leaving Neverland lawsuit and everything else like that. So, you know, to everyone who's watching this, you know, if you're a man being accused of some shit that you didn't do, don't pay any extortion money. It will never end. It, never it will ultimately end up just, if, if you did some dirt, yeah. just deal with it. Talk to your woman. <laughs> yeah, apologize. Hey. If she way. leaves you, then that's just how it is. Man. You know I mean? I interviewed Smokey Robinson recently. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was yeah, saying how that. his wife told him, you know, said, listen, when you go on the road, you do what you want. You know, just don't bring home a baby. Don't bring, don't bring and it home. And one day he brought home a baby. <laughs> that was the end of the marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, yeah, yeah. You know, I for I, and, and I, 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 I've, I've heard that from um, not successful like women that were married to celebrities, and they was like, it was all cool until you start bringing it home. Yep, it was like exactly. grand home. In 2017, the Tupac movie came out. Yeah, what'd you think of it? 
Well, I, I was a consultant on a Tupac movie for like 10 years. So with LT. Oh, because they were trying to make it. But John um, Singleton was originally supposed to do it. John, you had F. Gary Gray, you had Antoine uh, Fuqua. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we did, yeah. So, because um, our kids went to school together, so we chopped it up. So a lot, a lot of people didn't know Pac. If you didn't really know him, know him and hang out with him, then you mm -hmm. wanted different things. Um, John, which I thought, you know, uh, I mean, he could have did it. But I think John, he, John should have did it, but I guess John was pushing for a rape scene. I, yeah, in, in well, a couple of people was pushing for some scenes that when had nothing to do with the story. Yeah. Um, I think him, I think Fuqua, um, and was, you know, was gangsta. They were focusing on a different angle, which wasn't the, which wasn't you know the focus. Um, the first clip I think was like almost four hours, so would have been great because it kind of covered everything, but mm -hmm. it was too long. Then I gave him some notes, and it was down to like three twenty. And then they cut it down again, and then that's the version I saw, which was a studio cut. Yeah, um, I don't think Benny Boone was the right director. I'll just, I'll just well, say yeah, it. I'll just say it right now. I'll just say it. I watched it, and I, yeah. I enjoyed watching it. As someone who's probably <laughs> covered more of the Tupac story than probably any other interviewer, right. you know what I'm saying? It's just like, it just he just didn't really pull it off. You know, and I'm not saying it's his fault, whatever, but it's like yeah. when you watch like Snowfall and you watch... Yeah. yeah. All eyes on me. There's such a difference in quality level. Yeah. Well, you know I, mean, what I'm I mean, Benny Bones, a, he's a video director. He's, a movie so movie he's not director. a motion film picture. I mean, he, got, he had a chance, but that they had to get the film out. I think they were about to lose funding or something after a while because it was supposed to have been done like for 10 years. And yeah. I've seen the different actors that they were wanted to go through um, and play them. The one was too big. One didn't look like him enough. The other one couldn't no, act. I think the main actor, yeah. I think the he guy was great. actually. Yeah, he did. He did good for that. But before they they wanted um, Keith. They wanted Keith. Um, what's his name? The singer. He's the actor. They wanted, they wanted him. Keith, Keith Robinson. They wanted him. Okay. Uh, for a while, but he was too big. They, you know, he was kind of too tall, and then he was too thick. He'd have to lose a lot of weight because Park wasn't two hundred pounds. Um, <laughs> for real. Um, but he could act the part. But the whole thing was getting a script, and I think that's what they they uh, made a mistake at. Which was not trying to, you know, focus just on a particular part. They tried to tell the whole story. Yeah, and it's like you can't do that. Like I'm doing, I'm been working on a Miles Davis story for the last five years, just losing mm -hmm. weight. But I'm just talking about a piece, of, a particular part in Miles' life. Yeah, you know what I'm saying not trying to put his whole life into that. And I think that's where you have a problem. You can't tell nobody's life in two hours. Yeah, like I said, I wish it was a little bit better, but. But you know, it, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad it was made, and I'm glad that people got to right. see the, the story that I was already very familiar with. Yeah, people said so. Yeah. And so my thing is when I when I hear people say you messed it up, and I say, well, you go get your funding, and you go tell your story. Right. Did you see the scene? You go do the, the research. Did, uh -huh. you see, did you see the scene with the iPad in it? <laughs> you know, talking about <laughs> when you, like one of the final scenes when he was in the car in the BMW. Like you actually see him holding the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the '96. <laughs> there were no, there were no iPhones back then. <laughs> I don't think there's even like real cell phones back then. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, there were cell, no, there were cell phones out there, but, but yeah, not like no yeah, you'd have to have the, yeah, you know, just managed to slip in the scene. Um, mm. 2019, John Singleton died. Yeah. Did you maintain any level of contact with John over the years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, right, he just turned 50. So it was like Simon's birthday party. He was talking wow. about to do some more stuff together. He said he's been waiting for me to age so he could put me in more stuff because huh. I haven't aged since Poetic Justice. And everything he get me for, I, you just don't look old enough. And I'm like, so he said he had the right thing for me. And then I was like, uh, did you tell anybody about it? Because <laughs> I was going to do something on Snowfall. He was like, and I saw him at his birthday party. And he was like, we had the great conversation. And then, um, man, it was, um, he passed yeah, that was a shock. Yeah, that was real. Because he was pretty young, fifty. Yeah, yeah, but John lived. John, Lon, John got it in. He was, yeah. I don't let oh, the coyness fool you. He was John. He party. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're saying. No, 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 not like party. Just he, he rode. He was out. He was, you know, because he really didn't hang out a lot. Huh, but okay. at that particular point in his life, I saw him hanging out a lot more. Hang on TMZ and doing. And I was like, what the hell are you doing? Because he you know, normally, you know, he's, you know, focused. Snowfall is my favorite show on television when it's on. Yeah. I mean, even with him not being involved in it, it was yeah. just like, you know, we've interviewed some of the actors from Snowfall too. It's almost like a prequel to Boys in the Hood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's like, I feel like a lot of other shows, I mean, I think like Power is kind of like a cool show and I, mm -hmm. and I, I like to watch it, but it was more like 
Power is more kind of like fantastical. Like, you know, you can kill 20 people and no one saw nothing. You get away with it. And, you know, it's like you're, everywhere you go, no one, no one can ever catch you. You know, I feel like, you know, that was just more of a realistic film and the way it's shot, the characters. Right. It, I felt it was just a more realistic movie and you could really feel right. Singleton's fingerprints all yeah. over it. You know, the way it looks, the way it's mm. shot, the actors mm. that they chose yeah. and everything else like that. I think it's it was great. And uh, I, mean, I, I never got to, I've always wanted to interview Singleton. Every time well, we reached out, we could never get him. It, it's, it's almost as if we could tell Boys in the Hood, you know, in a series. You know yeah. I mean? And now he got to the point where, well, I know he wanted to get out of directing because they said it took so much time of his life, and two, three, four, five years on a project. Yeah. And if you write a director, do it, then you're really in it. But he wanted to produce some stuff and have it where he can move around. And then I think he always wanted to tell that story that uh, and LA story, but like you said, not um, with the with the with the with the um, influence of power or stuff. That okay, that's not believable. You know what I love about John Singleton is that LA is always such a character oh. in all of his projects. Like yeah. even like you know when I was watching. Um, you know, Poetic Justice this morning, like yeah. when you guys were driving out and you see like the burnt out buildings because yeah. of the, you know, the LA riots had just yeah. happened around the, the time of that movie. And it's always like, like South Central LA in particular is just so, you know, it's just a part of the film. It's like an actual character in Back the film. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like these movies would not have worked if they were in Cleveland or New York or yeah. Atlanta. It was like, he he managed to capture the area that he grew up in mm -hmm. and and turn it into a vital part of a lot of his films yeah. you know what i'm saying so um damn man i'm sorry if you're lost i was i was a huge fan yeah, it was the right place right time man he had, yeah. he had a beautiful eye on telling real stories about uh la um, yeah. and putting them in yep you know and i remember uh it was the episode of snowfall right after he died they kind of had this guy kind of being, you know, playing him. I don't know if you remember when they're kind of walking through the projects and there was mm -hmm. a dude with a camera where yeah, he had yeah, the yeah. X hat and glasses. Yeah. Like, look at that fucking camera out of my face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh shit, that's yeah. that's supposed to be John Singleton right there. That's kind of cool. Like that's his, you know, Alfred, like, that's his Alfred Hitchcock movie. Yeah, a little right? Alfred Hitchcock little moment. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. actually him, but you know yeah. No, but I'm saying did. but that Yeah, it was like that little thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you know he's in uh, you know he's a mailman in Boys in Hood. He's a he's a, he's in a lot of Oh stuff. really? Man, I must have missed that. He's a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I gotta go back. I gotta go back and watch. A, he plays a lot of little come in and pop out. You're like, well, that was John. Yeah, he was doing that. Uh, well, uh, uh, Chris Rock just dropped his Netflix special. Oh, yeah. You yeah. watched it? Yeah, I watched it, man. I watched it. <laughs> I, know, I watched I know, it. I was like, we just dropped. Uh, number one, did you ever see uh, the relationship between Tupac and Jada Pinkett? Have you ever, were you ever around both of them? Different periods. I have different relationships with, with both of them. I didn't know that they had that relationship, but I was friends with Jada's, uh, I did, when I was doing Talking Dirty After Dark. So I, I was friends with uh, Jada's aunt in mm -hmm. Baltimore. So I used to help Jada come over and read sides okay. uh, for when she was trying to be funny before a different world. Cause she was like, oh, I'm not funny. I got these, uh, these, these, these drama tears. I don't have these comedy tears. <laughs> and, uh, and so what, uh, she used to come, I used to help her read. She used to almost lived right around the corner from me when I lived oh. in La Cienega in okay. Cadillac over in that area. So that's when I met, you know, when I was Jada and then with Park, it was just different. I didn't know they knew each other like that. Ah, okay. Um, so you never actually saw them together. So she, she never came to the set. Okay. Um, I think at that time, I'm like, he was dating left eye. Lisa. Yeah, right. Yeah, I know that story. Lisa. So yep. She used to come to the set. So stuff like that. So that, you know, so that was, that's a whole nother Andre rising Tupac story. <laughs> yeah. I know. So, but uh, yeah, when I, when we, I knew they were friends later because we got a couple pictures together and stuff, but I know them two separately. Well, number one, when you saw the whole slapping incident at the Oscars, mm -hmm. what was the first reaction that you thought? I, I thought it was fake. You thought it was fake? Yeah. At first I thought it was fake. It wasn't fake. And then I saw... Chris's face, because Chris is a professional, and he was looking like, ah, oh, this, this wasn't in rehearsal. Do you know Chris Rock? Yeah, I know Chris. Do you know Will Smith? Well. I don't know Will as much as I know Chris. Okay, so Chris yeah. you know. Yeah, Chris I know. Chris is a very small guy. Yeah, yeah, and an introvert. Chris is never harmful, yeah. fly, and come out, loner, he just, yeah, Chris is. Yeah. So when you saw his face, you're like, oh, okay, this is real. Yeah, very real. Did you talk to him afterwards? No, I sent him his text, and I sent his brother a text. Because yeah. I, I kind of knew he was going through, you know, it's kind of, nobody wants to, you know, keep going through, well, I'm cool, you know, kind of give a hundred 
stories, answer at home. Carl's, I knew he was going through a lot. So I was like, I sent a message to his brothers, text him that I was praying for both of them. Well, and Chris Rock has been relatively quiet about it until Jill. this Netflix special. Right. Where he called Will and Jada bitches. All right. He went in. I mean, yeah. He called Will all, all types of bitches and then called Jada a bitch yeah. at one point. And, uh, you know, he kind of allured to the August Alsina entanglement right. situation. Right. What was your take? Well, number one, what did you think of the Chris Rock special? I think it was great. Just like he always, he touched on a lot of subjects, not just that. He um, did, yeah. He left yeah. that for the end. And he left, left for the end. What you do? That's the, he, he knew that's, what he was that's doing. That's the technique. That's the, he, he knew what he was say, doing. Yeah, you know, yeah. set up drag. Everybody's waiting for it. You lead them on. Yeah. He, he addressed uh, issues that people probably wanted his opinion on. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, um, he set it up perfectly. Whereas, you know, as victims, you know, people was getting, you know, people, everybody's taking a victim card now. Uh, which is, you know, which is okay. Uh, they, you can say something wrong, um, or like he was saying, you can get in line now just for your feelings, as far as in getting a check for it and something wrong. It's like leave that for real people that got real issues. You know, don't just get a check because now it's trending. Yet you can say I'm crazy or I have an issue. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I don't know in that moment would have made Will jump up and do that, but I have my own uh, opinion. What do you think? Of why do you think that Will decided on the night of the Oscars with the entire planet watching you, you are nominated for a Best Actor Oscar, uh -huh. and you decided to walk up to the stage and assault the host? Now, now, putting, now I look at it, when I talk about it on stage, okay. I say, okay, here it is. I say, okay, well, you got to look at it, because this wasn't the first time that this happened. This was, you know, this is, Chris has said, I think it's the third time he kind of joked on Jada. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? While he's a host in public. I'm like, okay, well, if you got to look at it, after, if I've been to 10 of your parties and my wife is the only one you're fucking with every time, maybe it's like, okay, come on. Maybe they finally clicked. It's like everybody else in the room, why are you always picking up with my wife? Why are you always messing with my wife? Can you say something else? And we know each other. So, it's, you know, out of the point, it could be like, no, well, come on, man. Everybody else in the room? Again, national audience, here we go. Now, that could have been that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because I, I would have felt the same way before I go. Like, you know, I bring my wife over to my brother's house, and he's saying something to her every time she come over, saying something about my kid, and loudly in front of everybody. I'm going to have a certain kind of feeling about that every time you're trying to put my wife on blast. Find somebody else this time. Okay, that, that's fair. Yeah. But as we all know, and I've been to a lot of comedy shows, when I sit in the front row, right. I expect to get roasted. Right. Okay, I expect to be recognized, and I expect whoever's on stage right. to talk shit. Yes, and that's why I'm in, and I'm okay with that because I'm in the front right. row, and that just comes but, with the territory. Exactly, but talk about me, my big Whoever ears. you bring with no. you yeah. will be roasted okay. right along with you. You're at a comedy show, but. At the same time, he could he could say, "Okay, can you talk about my ears? Can you talk about me this time? It's about me. Why has got to be my wife? You know." And and you have to look at it sometime like that. It could be like you know, and they could joke about it. He could have been like, "Oh," he, and she could have been like, "Here we go again." Now you saw why I got to be the joke. And to me, you know, what I, mean? I mean, that's you know. So as a comedian, you got to be prepared for that. You got to be prepared for you know if somebody come up on that stage now. I'm prepared. I mean, at the Oscars, though. I'm prepared. I don't care where, where you're at. Oscars, a funeral, church, baptism. I know when I ask whooping or something's out of pocket. Did you watch the, the Marlon Wayans uh, special? Yeah, I watched the Marlon Wayans. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting how they almost use some of the same jokes. Because they, mm -hmm. they both talked about that, yeah. that situation. Right. I mean, in fact, Marlon's whole thing was basically about that. Right. And I guess Marlon had a, had a history of Chris Rock fucking with him. Well, maybe he has. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I have my own version of how I tell him a joke if it would, if I would, have, you know, if he'd have came up on me. You know what I'm saying? So, but that's that's for the show. But I mean, but okay. but but I, you know, I mean, first of all, I I wouldn't have picked on you know his wife like that for the third time. You know what I mean, I, I kind of felt that. I kind of feel who somebody's not getting it, or I'm gonna be you know picking bones with you. I'd rather mess with you first. But if you do come up on that stage, that's your ass. Period. I mean, you know, I, I'm known for you know handling my own. So. So you've had people run up on your stage? No. Well, I have people. You know, yeah, come up there. Come on up here. Or want to fight me after the show? Yeah, come on. 
Okay. Have you had someone actually try to fight you during a show? Oh, yeah. A couple people. They never made it to the stage. Security would get them? <laughs> Security was getting them or I was about to smack them with the microphone. Or they sat down. <laughs> okay. Or they left. <laughs> but, but you've you had people try to fight you afterwards as well. Um, I mean, yeah, some people try to, you know, when I mean, you say it like that before, I'm like, well, you know, well, I ain't, I'm not on stage now. You don't, this, do, you don't do stand-up? I mean, I'm saying I'm not on stage now once we're at the club. Right. So, you know. I so, mean, listen, yeah. man, I've, I've been to lots of comedy shows, especially in L.A., and, wow. and things get dicey out here. Yeah. I mean, you know I'm I mean? not. I, I, I remember going, um, where was it? Uh, D. Ray Davis invited me to this one show, and one of the opening guys was like, Talking uh, about one dude and the guy's motherfucker, hey Trey, you know, hey Trey Crip, get down or lay down. He's like, <laughs> the, the yeah. comedian was just like, oh, well, I'm oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's go on to a different topic. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. well, but they, they say that too. I, I, I would say I've been blessed not to, you know, I've had that happen like after the show, like I'm in a comedy store, you know. They handling out, you know, my brother and, you know, he wasn't there. I'm taking up, you know, taking hosting night for him and they getting a little too noisy in the corner and I used to holler out some stuff. And I'm like, mm, OK, whatever. But then I have Big Shorty. You got security. Mm -hmm. Some people just do it, I think, to get a rise out of you. And because I'm, you know, some people, they just want to see me heckle people. But when I take it too far, then it's like, OK, you don't have to talk about me like that. But, yeah. but Chris, like you said, Chris, Chris has said exactly what it was. Chris is not a fighter. No. Chris is not a threat. And would Will Smith have, you know, thought differently if somebody else was up there that he knew? Right. Like, I, I used to, <laughs> what, what was the, one of my biggest clips when I asked Michael Jai White what he would do oh. <laughs> Will Smith had slapped him on stage. He was like, cut, hey, cut it out, Vlad. He, yeah. he was just like, his reaction yeah. was like, come on, come, come on. on. If you were on stage and, and, and Will stop Smith. It. Just stop it. <laughs> 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 it's just not a conversation, is it? <laughs> it's like he's not even gonna come up there. He gonna walk, wax on, and wax off before he even get. Because it was a, it was a. It was, come on, the slap came so slow. I'm like, Chris, you can get out the way of the slap. You couldn't even. You well, I don't think anyone was expecting this to happen. We're at the no. Oscars, like you know what I'm saying, like man, hey man, you know, I, he probably thought he's gonna go up there hey and maybe put his arm around him and talk some shit, rah rah rah, yeah, you know, blah blah. blah it's part of the show. He and then when it smack. didn't happen, you let him walk with his back to you, back off stage, not a foot in his ass. Yeah, when I yeah, try to shove him down, <laughs> jump on him, <laughs> catch him with a little choke hold so? in the bag, throw the bike at him, anything. Well, I mean, you know, he ended his show with a. Uh, he, he, I mean, he said his parents taught him not to fight uh, in front of white people, which is actually these, the same thing that Marlon Wayans said in his comedy. Show. It's funny how some of the same jokes were used by both comedians. I don't think the two of them got together and said, "Hey, let's use the same joke in our comedy no, shows." Like, no, no, no. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, it's, it's happened. So comedians have different takes on what they would have done, and they're yeah. from, you know, they're, they're all from New York. Mm, um, right. Yeah. So you know, but no, nah, my parents never told me don't fight in front of white people. Just don't get your ass whooped. Don't be like, disrespected <laughs> <laughs> for nobody. <laughs> that's that's what would have happened right there. Yeah. No, no. Nah, they got the right guy for the Oscars because he's very professional. Yeah. Yeah. No. Nah, no. Nah, it would have been he'd have had to call Charlie Mack and everybody out the back. Mm. Yeah. Period. And they all and they all good. Libra. Will's a Libra. He had a moment. Yeah, Will, I'm moment. a Libra. So it's like, you know, so, yeah. yeah. And, and there's nothing in life that has him, you know, um, tagged to any of those moments where he's lost. He's always been the nicest guy everywhere. I mean, every time I've ever met him, the energy, the people, he's, you know, so. He had a yeah. point. Yeah. You know, yeah. the whole entanglement thing was pretty, pretty weird. Yeah. That could have been, a, I think it's a, you, a gunny sack of stuff that just... Got, yeah, well, you know, got got to a point. And, I, I guess. Know. I mean, I, I've interviewed August Alcina before, uh, but I, I don't know Will or, or Jada. I mean, right. I've, I've met that. You know, I've met uh, Jaden. You know, uh, their son. But um, I guess the weird thing to me is about that whole situation is every marriage, every relationship is completely different. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I'm saying everyone who thinks that every marriage is traditional and this yeah. is the way it is, and no, you know, not. until death to us part, right. and you know, blah blah blah. Is, is living in a dream world, you know I mean? Especially once you get into levels of wealth and everything else like that. I fully understand that there is, every relationship is unique and functions in its own way. 
my relationships are unique. I'm never going to judge how anyone else functions on their relationship. Mm. But, but, what seems a bit odd to me is that if one of your partners is seeing someone else, mm. you don't usually all go on vacation together. <laughs> <laughs> that to me is the weird part. <laughs> I don't want to hang out with the guy who's fucking my wife. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm Maybe saying? They, like, yeah, I just, that's... we're all, and then that guy's also friends with my son. And you, you know what yeah, I mean? It's just, yeah, it's, it's weird... just such a clusterfuck on so many levels. And then after that, they all decide to do red table talk and, and talk about it and <laughs> put it all out there. Mm -hmm. That to me is the weird part. And I know as a man, and, and Will Smith is a man at the right. end of the day, I know that's not easy to swallow. Mm -hmm. All that. Just that whole thing I just described. I know it's not easy to swallow. But if he created that world, if that's the world. That's, that, and that's the world he yeah, created. You're, that's you're right. That's where he created. That's where he live in. Then, you know, that's, then, you know, you, to him, it's probably, you know, it, it's not as messy um, in Will Smith's world. Because mm. there's a lot of mess in that world if you want to put it back. I mean, if you hear the stories, it's like, okay, that ain't, that's just one of the stories. But, oh, you know, I, they, I, I've heard a lot more yeah. stories. So, so it's like, you. you know, so okay. To me, I wasn't actually surprised when I heard this part of the story. <laughs> I I, like, I'd been hearing stories from years ago from people that were around, and I'm not going to get sued so and tell like, you. Okay. But I'm saying, like, but I've, now I've heard it's some, a, some It's craziness. a running theme, and now you see it acting out in real time. Yes. <laughs> that's like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, well, you saw it. you slapped the guy who was on stage yeah. talking about it. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. you. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, and it's even and the reason why I asked, you know, have you ever seen uh, Jada and Pac together? Was because it got even got to the point where Will, in his book, said he was always mm. jealous of Jada's relationship with Tupac. Right. You know what I'm saying? So mm. he's putting that out there as well. Which he, he knows, I mean, that's if that's her true love, I mean, yeah, that's never going to go nowhere in somebody's head. I mean, are you coming behind a second guy all the time, especially if one tells you, oh, I mean, if, if you tell somebody, like, you know, well, I'm, I'm in love with that person, and I'm always been in love with that person, and, and but you never carry it out and you're with somebody else, that's, that's, I think that's the problem with telling people, you know, uh, your, 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 your true loves. Because now if they're still living or they're, or they're you know, just or as bigger powerful, than life, bigger like a than Tupac. life. Yeah, like, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, yeah, who, who you, would you say is the bigger, biggest figure, the bigger figure worldwide right now? Would it be Tupac or Will Smith? Worldwide? Worldwide. You see what I'm saying? It's almost, yeah, it's, I would almost say Tupac. I say, yeah, you would, you would say Tupac because he, he lives, you know, um, he's, he's, he's forever, Right, like, like, yeah, he's, he, 20, he, he, 25 yeah. years after Will's death, I don't think they'll still be talking about him the same way we're talking about 25 years after Tupac's nah, death. Nah, that's nah, what I'm nah, saying. Yeah, no, they won't. No, because yeah, Will, because Will, but Will, Will has enough work out there where Will has work, but Pac, but, no. not as a rapper, and not Pac, as well, a Pac also person. was sort of a figure of right. the struggle. Right, exactly. You see what I'm saying, yeah, Pac? Yeah. There's like murals and Pac of Pac in like Africa and, yeah. and stuff like yeah. that because he was like a Bob Marley type figure exactly. of someone that fought against oppression, right. fought against the government, right. power to the people, you know, right. was, was was the voice of the poor and, you know, and unheard and so forth. Will Smith's an actor. Right. There's a difference. He's a good actor and he's been in great films. Yeah. But people generally don't talk about Pac's acting career the way they talk about his music career. And even though he's in Juice was a great movie, you know, right. Buddy Justice was a great movie. But yeah. when people talk about Pac, they talk about All Eyes on Me. They talk about Dear Mama. Yeah. They talk about Hit Him Up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They talk about that type of thing. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard, I guess, to compete against someone who's just bigger than life. And, and But it's music. So you have yeah. music, something that you don't have to watch, you can continuously hear. Music, I think, is just always the the end of to the test of time. Because it's, it's, you know, you hear something from... 50 years ago mm -hmm. to now, I mean, you know, your Christmas songs when they come around, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and Pac is like, you know, I, mm. I think that um, between him and Will Smith, you're right. His, his, his songs talked about the struggle. Yeah. Bring this baby, we got to make it, we got to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the last kind of uh, real rap that you heard. The Nas's, the Pac's before they mm -hmm. start turning into the mumble mouth shit, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, Joe Torrey, man, glad we finally got to do the interview. Uh, yeah. I've been a long time fan, man. You got classics under nice. your belt. What do you got coming up next? Uh, yeah, um, man, Miles Davis story I'm working on. Miles, Miles Davis. So yeah, you're going to play Miles, Miles Davis? Yeah. 
You gotta lose some weight, though. Right? Yeah, I can lose a little bit. I lost like two, 20 pounds already. You gotta lose more. <laughs> I know, I know. We good. <laughs> well, well, you know, you could always use the, the heroin diet that uh, that Miles did. You know what I'm saying? No, no, I got the hair. I got, I got lost in the diet. I said the, the heroin. The heroin, the heroin diet. The heroin no, diet. We're not doing that. The heroin <laughs> diet. We're showing him in, his, in one of his best times. But yeah. Because yeah, he, he got really skinny by the end. Yeah, he did. Yeah, but, but we're showing him the time was one of his best times. So I'm trying to show him in a good light. Because everybody show movies on Miles Davis. Some of it is... Right, what, what, what was the name of the actor that did the Miles Davis movie? Don, Don Cheeto. Don Cheeto. Yeah, exactly. It was pretty good. Yeah, but But you it know. wasn't great. Yeah, it wasn't... I'm going to yeah. say it wasn't it great. Was, I'm sorry, Don. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. It wasn't a great film. You're right. Nope, everybody says that. Now, I love Don. I love yeah. him too. But the choices and... and the story they was trying to tell about Miles, you know, the King of Cool, I think you could have told a better one. Yeah, so he I'm, just yeah. seemed scattered and, you know, kind of messed up and, yeah. and so forth. Yeah, for the for the, the real King of Cool. So I want to mm -hmm. show a positive part of his life. So, and, you know, and I'm working on my channel, Joe Torrey TV. Right, and this is the 30-year um, uh, anniversary of Poetic Justice. 30-year anniversary of Poetic Justice coming up in um, July. So uh, we're trying to, you know, the ones that are still here, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? We, hey, we give peace to John and Park. Um, and Don Wilkerson, yeah. um, all of them who were on this. But uh, you know, Janet's still here. Janet, Regina's Regina, still here. Yeah. You're still here. Still here, man. Uh, what's the name of uh, Pac's mom who, who played the, um, in the movie? Oh, um, yeah, you, uh, yeah, Jennifer, Jennifer Lewis. Yep. Um, but also, uh, his uh, John Singleton's daughter was working on a series of Poetic ah. Justice. Yeah. Oh. I saw her. Yeah, I saw her. Uh, Dope. Yeah, I saw her at, at one of the Pan African Film Festivals, and she was working on a Dope. series of it. So Justice. Will be served, hopefully, for a poetic justice. That's what it is. Joe Torrey, man. Until next time. Till next Peace. time. Bam. <laughs> <laughs>